Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I looked at the stack of Excel worksheets that just populated my inbox on the company SharePoint site and realized I would be working until at least 6.30 p.m. It happens every month. Managers would wait until almost the last minute before sending their reports, and it was left to me to collate the data. So much for getting home at a decent hour. So I called my wife, Samantha, to explain the situation and let her know I would be working late again. End of the month blues again, Mike? My wife asked. That's me, by the way, Mike Jacobs. I could hear the snarkiness in Samantha's question. Yeah, happens every damn month. Some of these people wait till the very last second to send this stuff, almost as if they expect something great to fall in their lap. I am sorry, I should be done about 6.30, as usual. No problem. I figured it would happen, Samantha told me with a sigh. Anyway, I reserved a table for two at Luigi's for 7 p.m. tonight. I thought you could use the break. Luigi's was a small but comfortable Italian restaurant we both enjoyed. It sat next to an equally small dance club, and we often enjoyed a drink and a few slow dances before returning home to finish the evening in bed. I smiled at the thought of a nice evening with my lovely wife. Yes, I could, I responded. That was very thoughtful of you, sweetheart. So, seven-ish then? Seven-ish it is, Samantha confirmed. Ta-ta for now, she added before ending the call. I thought it odd that she didn't finish the conversation with her usual loving endearment. Then I realized her boss, Wilson Langley, the senior partner of the Hempstead Law Group, was probably within earshot. I looked at the handset for a second before placing it back on the phone, then went to work. I saved the spreadsheets, opened my master sheet, and started the macro that would do the lion's share of the work. It used to take hours to pour through all the data, but the macro that our IT guys put together did an excellent job of collating and sorting everything out and it took only a fraction of the time to finish. Freshening my coffee, I sat back and thought about the last few years and my life with Samantha as the macro chugged away. I wasn't always an office worker. In fact, until about seven years ago, I was a federal agent working for a somewhat special task force, a joint public-private venture. I was one of the first agents assigned to the task force and reported directly to the man at the top of the food chain, a family law attorney named Bill Jackson. I worked with some of the best in the business. Frank Michaels, for one, Oscar Warren was another. Unfortunately, Frank was killed in the line of duty. Oscar married the boss daughter and is working up the ladder. The agency I worked for, officially dubbed the Home Front Security Task Force, was created for one primary purpose, to go after something called the Mutual Marital Assurance Society, or MMAS. The organization was founded by a female lawyer whose husband cheated on her. She was later shafted by the court system, so she set out to exact revenge. At first, MMAS targeted cheating husbands, punishing them in horrific ways. They proved to be an elusive bunch, and we spent most of our time in those days reacting to protect the husbands whose wives set them up for punishment. We called those interventions, and we were usually successful. Remember that when I speak of punishment, it is usually quite brutal. More than one unsuspecting husband died from the harsh treatment doled out. Many more became scarred for life, both physically and emotionally. The hospital at Fort Apache, the base where the task force was headquartered, was full of men suffering from punishment meted out by MMAS operatives. My time on the task force made me more than a bit jaded regarding relationships. After seeing what so many men had suffered at the hands of their spouses, I shied away from anything that resembled a committed relationship. So I went from intervention to intervention, doing my best for the men I was assigned to help. My life changed drastically, thanks to a bullet that smashed my right femur a few inches above the knee during one of those interventions. After months of surgeries and physical therapy, I was finally able to walk with the assistance of a cane. But my career as a federal agent was finished. Being the kind of man he is, Bill told me to my face that my time with the task force was over, and there were no available slots that I could fill. I got a medal, the thanks of a grateful nation, and a monthly disability check. Bill thought that wasn't enough. So he spoke to his contacts and got me a job as an assistant operations director with Iverson Security Services, or ISS. ISS is a nationwide company that provides uniformed on-site security, private investigative services, and armed security for well-heeled VIPs with more dollars than cents. One of the company's clients just happens to be the task force I once served. Better yet, the headquarters where I would work just happened to be in my hometown, where I own a two-story house bequeathed to me by my grandparents. Relieved that I wouldn't have to move or sell the place, I happily accepted after a short interview with Jack Iverson, the president and founder of the company. My job was simple compared to what I used to do. Basically, I pushed paper from one pile to another. 
I made face-to-face -face visits with clients to iron out any issues or do whatever it was that Greg Hamilton, the COO at the time, needed to be done. That's when I first met Samantha Green. At the time, she was an office assistant with Hempstead. She was tasked with finding someone to provide security for the firm's downtown headquarters building. When negotiations between our marketing people and Langley started to bog down, Greg sent me in to wrap things up. It was my job to either get the contract signed or end the nonstop back and forth. Wilson Langley seemed impressed that ISS would send someone with my credentials to clarify things. I knew the game he was playing. He wanted more services for less money, like any savvy businessman. To that end, he spent weeks stringing our marketing people along, making minor changes to each offered contract. I explained our standard operating procedures and informed him that we were happy to adjust to his firm's needs. Still, our initial contract was the same one we employed for all our customers. In the event that he had special needs or requirements, he could always contact my department to make the necessary adjustments, providing they were legal and reasonable. In other words, fish or cut bait. Is that right, Mr. Jacobs? He asked, laughing. I shrugged my shoulders before responding. I suppose that's one way of looking at it, Mr. Langley, I responded. I appreciate your candor. Very well. You have my business, the older man stated, extending a hand. Have your people send me the best contract you can put together and I'll sign it. Thank you, Mr. Langley. I told him as we shook hands. We put the contract together and true to his word, Wilson Langley signed. Afterward, he promoted Samantha and made her his executive assistant. I was more than a little surprised when Samantha called me later that week to inform me of her promotion. I asked her out for dinner to celebrate, and she accepted, beginning our relationship. I wasn't expecting anything to come of it, and I was surprised to learn that she wasn't put off by my disability. A year later, Greg retired, and old man Iverson promoted me into the COO slot. I knew that Greg had been grooming me for the job, but was surprised to see the transition happen so fast. It didn't take long for me to adapt to my new position, and I knew the extra money would come in handy. That's when I decided to open a new bank account for my disability since I no longer needed to rely on it for monthly expenses. My plan was to save it for my eventual retirement. For some reason, I never mentioned that account to Sam. We celebrated my promotion with dinner at Luigi's Friday, where I proposed marriage. After Samantha accepted my proposal, she took me to meet her parents. I already knew her father was Jacob Green, one of the wealthiest men in the state, but I had never met the man in person. He turned out to also be one of the most condescending a-holes I had ever met. He glared at the walking stick in my left hand with a frown before extending his hand. I almost felt the disdain emanating from his body as we shook hands. So, Sam tells me you were a federal agent, shot in the line of duty, he snarled after lighting a large cigar. That's correct, I confirmed in a neutral tone. Who did you work for? The Home Front Security Task Force, I answered. I saw one eyebrow go up. Never heard of him, Jacob growled. What did you do for them? Scrub the shitters? His sneering arrogance was really pissing me off, but I knew that's what he was hoping for. Sam had warned me that he could be crass and salty, so I decided to cram it back down his throat without letting him know he had gotten to me. I'm not allowed to talk about everything I did, but I can tell you this. I killed them, I answered calmly. His eyebrows instantly went up as his eyes widened. I smiled, then continued. At least the ones I didn't toss into jail. He recovered before continuing. Looks like you missed one though, didn't you? He queried while pointing at my right leg. I chuckled. He got me in the leg all right, but he didn't survive the encounter. Blew his head clean off. They never did find his entire skull. I responded with a smile. You see, I hate to lose an argument. The old man looked startled for a moment. Then his face softened and morphed into a wide grin. Then he laughed out loud. You had me going there, Mike kind of reminded me of myself at your age. Welcome to the family, son, he added as he extended his hand. You know, I'm still gonna insist that you sign a prenup if you want to marry my daughter. No offense, but I want to make sure you're not just sniffing after her trust fund. No offense taken, Mr. Green, I told him as we shook hands, and I have no problem with a prenup, so long as it's reasonable. And equitable. Good, but no more of this, Mr. Green crap, you hear me? You marry my little girl. You call me Pop if you want. All right, Pop. He laughed and called Sam into the parlor. Is everything all right? Samantha asked when she came into the room. I think so, her father answered. You picked a good man here. Someone with a backbone and a set of balls to match. A lot better than that last piece of crap you married. Sam had already told me about her first husband, a man she met in college. She didn't tell me the whole story but admitted they were divorced. I certainly think so, 
Sam said as she walked to her father. So, are you two okay, then? Yeah, we're just fine, aren't we, Mike? Absolutely, Pop. The old man smiled as he looked up at his daughter. See? Now, why don't you go help your mother with dinner? We'll be right along. Okay, Dad, she responded, giving him a kiss on the cheek. After she left the room, he looked at me. Tell me something, Mike. Seriously, did you really mean what you said about killing people? Of course, I told him, causing the blood to drain from his face. But they were all bad guys and really deserved it. Maybe you can tell me about it one of these days, Jacob said. I'd love to, Pop, but it's all classified, and I signed a non-disclosure agreement. He regarded me for a bit before slowly nodding his head. I can respect that, son, he finally said. The rest of our visit went quite well after that. When Sam and I left, her parents and I had warmed up to each other. I guess the old guy needed to know he could respect his future son-in-law. The wedding, which was held in a large old church, was well attended. We flew to Hawaii for our honeymoon on Jacob's dime, and Sam moved into my house when we returned, selling her condo. Life went well for us, at least until a few months ago. My computer dinged, bringing me back to reality. I saw a dialogue box telling me the macro had completed its job. I looked over the final product, spot checked the numbers to ensure it was accurate, then saved and printed the package after completing my executive summary. I put the report in a binder, closed everything down, and placed it on Jack's desk so he would see it first thing in the morning. If it had been anyone else, I would have just emailed it. But my boss is what one could call old school and preferred an actual printout he could hold in his hands, and I can't blame him for that. After washing up and combing my hair, I donned my suit jacket, grabbed my walking cane, and looked around before turning off the lights. Glancing at my watch, I saw it was 6.32 p.m. and knew I had plenty of time to buy some flowers for Sam on the way to Luigi's. I got in my car and turned on the sound system, letting the strains of thick as a brick wash over me. Okay, so I like classic Jethro Tull. Sue me, or sue my father, if you insist. He's the one who got me hooked on Tull as a kid. In fact, he took me to the first concert I ever attended. Naturally, it was a Tull concert. We had a great time, and I still remember all the other kids saying it was so cool that I had a father who liked rock music, and I didn't argue the point since they were right. Even now, Dad and I frequently enjoy a cigar while listening to some old Tull songs. I got to the restaurant and saw it was 6.55 p.m., so I texted Sam to tell her I was there. She had said, 7-ish, which, in Samantha speak, meant anywhere between 6.55 and 7.15, and I didn't see her car in the parking lot. K was all the response I got. No emojis, no terms of endearment. Ordinarily, this wouldn't bother me, but it did tonight. For the last several weeks, Samantha had been somewhat cold and moody. I asked her repeatedly what was bothering her, but she would just dismiss me with a wave of her hand and an offhand comment. I hoped the flowers I bought would put her in a better frame of mind. Sighing, I got out of the car, flowers in hand, and went into the restaurant. The woman at the door smiled when I entered, and her smile widened when she saw the flowers in my hand. Jacob's, party of two, I announced. Right this way, sir, the young woman replied as she grabbed two menus. I followed her to a table by the back wall and sat so I could see the restaurant's interior, partly out of habit. She handed me a menu and poured a glass of water before leaving. I sipped my water as I read over the menu. I already knew what I wanted and was simply killing time as I waited for my wife to show up. The next 20 minutes seemed to go by agonizingly slow. I saw it was 7.20 and looked up to see if Sam had shown up, but she hadn't. Then I saw him walk in my direction. I could tell from his dress and manner that he was a process server. I had seen many of his type over the years. I also noticed the manila envelope in his hand, which was a dead giveaway. I hoped he would bypass me but knew in my gut he wouldn't. Michael Jacobs? The man asked when he reached my table. Yes, I replied. May I please see some identification? Of course, I told him as I pulled out my wallet and showed him my driver's license. He handed me the envelope and took a picture with his phone. You've been served, sir, he intoned. Have a good evening. With that, he turned and walked away. I watched him leave and open the envelope. I already knew what was in it and wasn't surprised when I saw the paperwork marked Petition for Dissolution of Marriage. I hadn't done anything to warrant this, but it fit the attitude Samantha had been displaying over the last few weeks. She was divorcing me, claiming adultery, which was a flat-out lie. Pulling my phone from my pocket, I sent Sam a text, WDF. Then I heard a woman's voice as I read Samantha's petition. Mr. Jacobs? I saw a reasonably petite blonde in a business suit, standing at the table. Turning on the phone's video record app, 
I placed it back in my pocket so the camera lens would capture the conversation, which I suspected would not be very comfortable. That depends, I responded. Who might you be? The woman held out a hand. Allison Cartwright, Hempstead Law Group. I started reaching for her hand, but stopped after her following statement. I'm representing your wife. I put my hand back down, embarrassed, and looked at the paperwork in front of me. May I sit down, please? It's a free country. Help yourself. She pulled out a chair and sat, facing me. A waitress came by, apparently thinking the woman across from me was part of my party of two. Are you two ready to order? The waitress, whose name tag read, Cindy, asked, holding a pen and a pad. No. I won't be staying much longer, I told Cindy. Allison turned away, and Cindy simply nodded her head, not expecting my response. Very well, sir, Cindy said. Let me know if you change your mind. I waited until she was gone before looking at Allison. My client requested I collect the papers after you sign them, Allison said, continuing her statement. So, your client, my soon-to-be ex-wife, requested you collect the papers I just received expecting me to sign them without reading them or consulting an attorney of my own. Have I got that right? Yes. Something like that, Allison answered quietly. Well, you can tell your client she can eat my shit and die, I hissed. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be going home. You'll hear from my attorney soon. Mr. Jacobs, that won't be possible, Allison said. First off, my client has taken out a restraining order against you and you aren't allowed to come within 500 feet of the marital home. Really? And I suppose she wants the house as well? Yes, actually, she does. And I feel she's entitled to it. Did your client tell you that house is in my name only? And has been ever since it was bequeathed to me by my grandparents? Long before we were married. Which means it's not community property. Uh, no, she didn't, Allison said. But you feel she's entitled to it anyway? After what you've done, yes, Allison said. Pulling an envelope out of her purse, she tossed it on the table and I looked inside to see a stack of photos. I wasn't surprised to note they were pictures of two people having sex. I already knew I wasn't one of the people in the images, and I suspected she also knew. Allison wasn't finished, however. You see, Mr. Jacobs, we have photographic evidence of your infidelity, she said. We also have video. My client has asked me to inform you that if you don't sign those papers, she will see to it those photos and the videos they came from get delivered to everyone you know, your boss, as well as your family and friends. That's extortion, I told her. A felony in this state. And the fact that you're a participant in that act makes you an accessory in Samantha's crime. Allison smirked as she shrugged her shoulders. Extortion, that's just another name for family law. Trust me, Mr. Jacobs, there's a lot more we can do to you, she quipped. Seeing the look on my face, Allison softened her tone. My client isn't completely unreasonable, however. She is willing to let you come to the house long enough to get what you need for a few days. I've been asked to accompany you. Well, isn't that just magnanimous of her? I quipped sarcastically. Allison recoiled at my words and my tone but said nothing. I decided to play it cool for the time being, grabbed the packet of photos and the divorce paperwork, and stood up. Follow me if you must. I hadn't ordered anything, so I left the flowers and twenty dollars for the waitress for her trouble and angrily strode out of the restaurant as fast as my cane would allow. Even so, Allison had difficulty keeping up. I got into my car, ended the video app, and sped out of the parking lot, not caring if Allison was behind me. I got to the house and parked in front of the garage. I opened the garage door and saw the empty space where Samantha usually parked. I took a deep breath and looked at the house. Then I remembered my time on the task force. I recalled the numerous times unsuspecting husbands were ambushed in their own homes by MMAS operatives, who drugged, then abused, and tortured the men. Is that what you have in store for me, Sam? I asked no one in particular. Well, guess what? Ain't happening today. I unlocked my glove box, pulled out the holstered 9mm semi-automatic pistol I kept there, made sure a round was in the chamber and attached it to my belt. As Allison parked by the curb, I got out of the car and went to the front door. I unlocked the door but didn't open it completely. Putting the keys back in my pocket, I drew the pistol out of its holster. Allison's face went white at the sight of my firearm. It's alright, I have a concealed carry permit, I told her. And I know how to use this. That's not necessary, Mr. Jacobs, Allison stammered, her eyes on the pistol. I'll be the judge of what's necessary or not. Ladies first, keep your hands where I can see them at all times, and don't even think of reaching for anything. Give me cause, and I'll drop you so fast you'll be dead before you know it. Understand? Uh, yeah, I understand, she said. I motioned for her to enter first with the gun. 
Good. Go on. Open the door. I'll be right behind you. Allison eyed the pistol as she crept up the stairs to the front door. Open it, I commanded. She nervously opened the door and went inside the house. I followed behind, pistol in my right hand, while using my cane to support myself with my left. My training kicked in as I quickly turned off the security alarm and looked around to ensure no one was inside. I motioned for Allison to stand in the center of the room. Toss your purse on the couch, I ordered. After Allison obeyed, I instructed her to put her hands on her head and stay put, and I nodded when she complied. And remember what I said? Follow my orders to the letter, and you'll walk out of here in one piece. I slowly walked around the ground floor and ensured no one else was there. I opened the door to the basement and turned on the light. I looked around and saw no one there, so I went back into the front room where Allison was standing. Upstairs. Now, I ordered. Allison started for her purse, but I stopped her. Leave it. She obeyed and headed for the stairs. After she got up a couple steps, I sat down in the stair lift, something I had installed after my discharge. Allison looked at me as we slowly made our way to the second floor. What are you looking for anyway? She asked. Just making sure you and Samantha didn't leave any nasty surprises for me. You think we would do something like that? Allison asked. Been known to happen before, I told her. After your threat at the restaurant, I'm just being careful. We got to the top of the stairs, and I got back on my feet. Stay here. Don't move, I said before checking the rooms on the second floor. Once I was certain no one else was in the house, I directed Allison into the master bedroom and holstered my pistol. What's this? I asked, seeing a clothing bag and an overnight bag on the bed. Samantha took the liberty of putting some of your things together to speed things up. I looked through both bags, not sure what to expect anymore. Satisfied that nothing had been sabotaged and no bugs were placed in my things, I went into the closet and pulled a few more items out. Then I pushed several hanging items to one side, revealing my built-in fireproof safe. I opened the outer door, ensuring Allison couldn't see what I was doing and placed my hand on the black plate underneath. The scanner verified my fingerprints, and the inner door was unlatched. I saw the strap of $100 bills and pulled it out. I figured the $10,000 in the strap would be enough to hold me over for a bit. While there, I grabbed some critical papers and flipped a switch in the back of the safe, activating the whole house surveillance system. From this time forward, everything that happened in the house would be recorded and saved to a cloud server. Every motion, every word, and both sides of every phone call on the landline. I could watch and listen anytime I wanted, and if I chose, I could monitor everything in real time. This was a system I had installed while in the task force, and I hadn't used it since before my wedding. Even though the technology had been updated since the system was first installed, I knew it would work and would capture whatever evidence I needed. I closed and locked the safe, then returned to the bedroom where Allison was waiting for me. I put everything in the overnight bag. Then I pulled my wedding ring off and tossed it on the dresser. Are you ready now? Allison asked. Yeah, I told her. Good. I'll carry your clothing bag down if you want. I know you need your left hand. Thank you, I said coldly. We walked downstairs, and I went into my home office. I need to take care of a few things before I go. Wait here, I told her. I went into my office, my inner sanctum. Samantha rarely ever came into this room as she had her own office. But I wasn't about to take any chances. I changed the primary boot-up password on my computer just in case Samantha tried to access it. Then I disconnected the external backup drive and set it aside to take with me. I flipped a switch in the closet that activated my emergency file destruction system. Like the video surveillance system, it had been installed while I was in the task force but had remained off for the last seven years. If anyone broke in and tried to take any of my files, they would find only ashes by the time the incendiary devices finished their job. I changed the security code on the door to the office and double-locked it, something I hadn't done in years. Taking one last look around, I closed the door and went back into the front room, where Allison was waiting for me. Ready now? She asked. Let's go, I said flatly. I locked the front door and reset the alarm system before closing it. Allison turned to me after putting the clothing bag in the trunk of my car. Just so you know, your joint account has been frozen. Samantha has already taken out her share. Don't wait too long to sign the papers. I hope to hear from your lawyer soon, she said. Trust me. I don't know what the hell kind of game you and Samantha are playing, but I promise you this. I will get to the bottom of it, and I promise you heads will roll. Just so you know, you and your client have declared war, I hissed. Allison's face turned white as she took in my words. You're now my enemies. You drew first blood. And I don't like to lose an argument. I headed downtown, 
where I knew of a hotel where I could get an extended stay room at a reasonable rate even without a reservation. ISS had used this hotel many times over the years, so much so that they gave us a nice discount. I paid for a week's stay in cash, figuring I would be back in my own house by then. I also didn't want to make it any easier for them to find me, even though I figured they were having me followed. The clerk was surprised to see me hand over a small pile of $100 bills, but he said nothing as he put them in his cash register and handed me a key card. A bellhop took my luggage and followed me to the room on the 11th floor. After putting everything away, I ordered dinner from the hotel's kitchen, which I knew was open until midnight. Then I pulled out my phone and blocked Samantha's number. I knew several divorced men who had gotten into trouble simply by replying to texts and phone calls. My next action was to call my boss, Jack Iverson, to let him know what had happened. Damn, son, that's cold, old man Iverson said. Tell you what, I'll call Alice Hawkins and see if I can get you in to see her first thing in the morning. I'll text you when I finish with her. Thanks, boss, I appreciate that, I told him as we ended the call. Alice Hawkins is a family law attorney who hates cheaters with a passion. I got a text from Jack about 30 minutes later confirming my 9.30 a.m. appointment with Alice. He also offered me the company's private investigative services at no charge. I accepted and sent a thank you text in response. I grabbed my laptop and set it up, connecting to the hotel's Wi-Fi. I first checked our joint account, and it was frozen, but not before Samantha had withdrawn nearly 80% of it. Our joint credit cards had been paid off and canceled, and our joint savings account was also mostly gone. Fortunately, all of the monthly bills had already been paid. I logged into my disability account, which was at a different bank. I was relieved to see that it was still available. I now felt vindicated in not telling Samantha about that account. I next logged into my home surveillance system and saw there were two videos already saved to the cloud. I pulled up the first video and saw Samantha and Allison coming into the house. A man in a well-tailored suit accompanied Samantha. Interesting, I thought to myself. Looking at the timestamp, I realized this happened shortly after I left. Well, how did it go? Did he sign the papers? Samantha asked after they were all inside the front room. No, Allison said. I told you he probably wouldn't. Legally, he has 30 days to respond. By the way, you didn't tell me he would be armed. Armed? You mean like, with a gun? Yes, Samantha, that's what armed usually means, Allison answered sarcastically. I was never so scared in my life, she declared. He used to be a federal agent, Samantha quietly told her. He was shot in the line of duty. That's why he has that cane. I know he has a concealed carry permit. Oh, wonderful, Allison said. You could have said something to me in advance. Wait, the man interjected. Are you saying he pulled a gun on you? Yes, Allison responded. He went through every room in the house, almost as if he was expecting someone to be here. Who did he work for? Do you know? No, not exactly, Samantha told her. Some kind of a task force. He never talked about his work much, though. I know he once told my father that he killed people he didn't throw in jail. Task force? Interesting. I'll have to look into that. Allison said thoughtfully. Terrific. That is terrific. A mad former fed with a gun. What do you think he's gonna do when he learns the whole truth? Settle down. He's not gonna do anything, Allison said. Yes, he's angry, and to be honest, he has every right to be. But he's not stupid, and he's not gonna learn the whole truth. One other thing, Samantha. What? Why didn't you tell me this was his home before you two got married? I didn't think it would matter, Samantha answered. Why? Why? Are you kidding me? Technically speaking, you have no right to this place in a divorce. But you said I deserved to have it. And I meant it. But you just made my job a whole lot harder, Allison spat. So, does that mean we can set him up now? The man asked. I've got a whole thumb drive chock full of images and video right here with me. It won't take me but a second to put it on his computer. Then we'll have him dead to rights. He'll be in jail before he knows what hit him. Put that away, right now, Allison commanded. We're not at that stage yet. Besides, he took his backup drive when he left, and he locked the door to his office. I think he also changed the security code to that lock. So, the man asked, give me a tire iron. I can use that to break through this door. Plus, Sam gave me the password to his computer. Don't even think of it, Allison said, her face red. We're going to have to be careful here. Don't do anything rash. You hear me? Just give me some time to think things through. I'll need to find out everything I can about your husband, Samantha. I have federal contacts. Let me see what I can get from them. In the meantime, you two cool your jets. And don't do anything stupid. You hear me, Alan? We don't work in the same department, but I'm still senior to you. 
Got it. I hear ya, the man sheepishly said. At least now I had a first name, and I knew just how far they would go to set me up. But why? Allison left the house, and the video ended when Samantha and Alan walked up the stairs. The next video was taken in the master bedroom. Alan took his jacket and tie off, throwing them on the back of my chair. He followed up with the rest of his clothing as Samantha undressed. When she was nude, he took her in his arms. Come on, Sam, why don't we get under the covers and enjoy ourselves? He asked with a wry smile. Samantha looked up at him as she returned his smile. I guess it wouldn't hurt, she said. After all, this will be our bedroom before long. You might as well get used to it. She turned and spotted my ring on the dresser. Oh, look at this. Mikey left his wedding ring. How thoughtful. Maybe I can pawn it with the rest of his crap? Both of them laughed at that. She tossed the ring back on the dresser before returning to the bed. So, which side is mine? Alan asked, and Samantha pointed to the side closest to the door. That side, she told him. Alan pulled the covers back and got in the bed. Samantha followed, climbing on top of him afterward. This is so nice, not having to worry about whether or not my weight will bother your leg. Talk about devastating. This was the first time I had heard her complain about my leg. It usually didn't bother me unless she sat on it for too long, but even then, I never let her know. Until now, I thought my injury never bothered her. That's right. Old Mikey's a cripple, Alan sneered. Well, I'll have you know I'm in perfect shape. Gimme that body of yours. Samantha giggled as she wriggled herself on top of him. Put that big meat inside me and drill me silly, she demanded. Alan obliged. Aren't you still on the pill? He asked as he bucked inside her. No, I quit taking those today, Samantha told him. This was new, as I never knew she was on the pill. She knew that I had a low sperm count, which, according to several doctors I had seen over the years, was something I was born with. But again, we had discussed it, and Sam never seemed concerned about it. It just meant the odds of my fathering a child were reduced. Then get ready to be pregnant, Alan said. Once done, I stopped the video, unable to watch any more. I felt my dinner start to come back up and headed for the bathroom. After emptying my guts into the toilet, I washed my face and counted to ten while taking long deep breaths. I couldn't believe what I had just seen. The only woman I had ever truly loved in my entire life had made a mockery of our wedding vows. And she had done it in the bed we had shared for the last several years. I began to wonder if I ever really knew her. After collecting myself, I went back into the room and looked through the pictures Allison had given me. They all had a date and time stamp in the lower right corner and were also marked with a location, Dallas, Texas. Going back to my laptop, I pulled up my calendar. I was in Seattle on the exact dates the photos were supposedly taken in Dallas, which meant I also had receipts for any expenditures I made. I figured that alone should be enough to prove I wasn't the man in the photos. I looked closer at the man and noticed no clear face shots. Interesting, I thought. Then it hit me. Examining the photos, I realized two pictures showed the man's right thigh. There were no scars present in either image. I could easily prove that all of these photos were staged. But why? Unless… Damn her, I thought. Samantha intended to use the prenuptial to screw me in a divorce to cover up for her infidelity. Adultery meant the guilty party left the marriage only with what he or she brought into it with no support. I looked closer at the divorce papers and realized Samantha went far beyond what the prenup stipulated. She not only wanted my house but also 80% of all the marital assets and 75% of my 401k, along with a crippling amount for maintenance. I knew there was no way she would ever get that much in court, which explained why Allison pushed me to sign the papers sight unseen. I wanted to find out what I could about this Allen character. I thought he worked with Samantha's law firm, so I went to their website. Sure enough, I found him. Alan Williams, a junior partner who joined the firm after leaving New York a few months ago. I decided to have our investigators look into his background. Seeing it was pushing 11.30 p.m., I shut my laptop down and prepared to go to bed, but my phone buzzed. Looking, I saw it was Jacob Green, Samantha's father. I was surprised he would call so late in the evening but decided to take the call anyway. Mike, this is Jake Green. How the hell are ya, boy? He asked in his usual salty manner. Frankly, I've had better days, Pop, I answered. I'll bet you have. I was at the club with Langley, and he told me that you and Sam are getting divorced, Jacob said. Imagine my surprise when he asked me how I handled the news of my daughter's pending divorce. I tried Sam's phone, but it went straight to voicemail. Wanna fill me in? It's true. She had me served this evening. Claims adultery. Did you do it, boy? Jacob asked in a severe tone. This was just like him, direct and to the point. It was one of the things I admired about the man. 
Ell no, Ian suarat. But she did. What? You telling me she cheated around on you, but claims you messed around on her? That's exactly what I'm telling you, Pop. You got proof of this? Sure do. You want to see it for yourself? I asked him. As a matter of fact, yes, I do. Where are you? I'm coming over right now. I told him where I was staying, and he repeated it for verification. I'll be there in a half hour. I don't give a shit how late it is. I want to see this so-called evidence. I'll be here, Pop, I told him. We ended the call, and I got everything ready to show him, then made a small pot of coffee, knowing he would want some. I heard a knock on the door, grabbed my pistol, and looked through the peephole, seeing it was Pop and verifying that he was alone. I cracked the door open. It's just me, son. No one else is here, Pop said. I unlatched the chain and opened the door but kept my pistol handy. Come on in, I told him. He walked in, and his eyes grew wide when he saw the 9mm handgun. What the hell? You expecting trouble? He asked, shocked. Always. I told him as I closed and locked the door. Well, put that damn thing away, will ya? It makes me nervous, Pop said. I made the weapon safe and put it back in the holster, close by my side. Want some coffee before we get started? I offered, holding out a paper cup. Pop shrugged his shoulder and took the cup. What the hell, he said. I poured each a cup and we sat down. Are you sure this is coffee? He asked after a tentative sip. That's what the package says, I answered, causing him to laugh. Show me what you got, he finally said. I handed him the photos Allison gave me earlier that evening. Pop looked through them, his brows furrowed. He sighed and handed them back to me. What do you think? I asked. Well, the guy in those photos does seem to bear a slight resemblance, but whoever he is, he ain't you. What makes you say that? For starters, I've seen you in swimming trunks. That fella doesn't have a scar on his right thigh, Pop said. In a couple of those photos, he looks like he's putting all his weight on that right knee. I've never seen you do that. I couldn't help but smile at his observation. He was right, however. Since being shot, I have never been able to put all my weight on that knee. One other thing, I added. Look at the date and timestamp on those photos. According to Allison, this happened in Dallas. I was in Seattle when these pictures were allegedly taken, and I have the receipts to prove it. Interesting, the older man said. You said you have proof that Samantha is cheating on you. I want to see it. It's pretty graphic, Pop, I warned, and he waved off my concern. I'm an adult boy. There's nothing I haven't seen before. Trust me on that. Okay, have it your way. This was from earlier this evening, after I left the house. I told him as I started the videos. He watched the action play out on my laptop with his brows furrowed. When they finished, I brought up the real-time surveillance cameras. Samantha and Alan were sleeping in my bed, naked, arms and legs wrapped around each other. I've seen enough, he said. Turn it off, please. I ended the video and closed the lid on my laptop. Well? I asked. I believe you, son, he finally said quietly. He looked deep in thought for a few moments, then looked at me. You think this has anything to do with your time on the task force? The idea had crossed my mind, and I found his question intriguing, so I wanted to hear his reasoning. What makes you ask that? I could see him carefully choosing his words. I haven't exactly been completely straight with you, son. Please understand that, like you, I have been sworn to a level of secrecy. I understand, Pop, I reassured him. I know all about the task force, he told me quietly. I also know about that MMAS bunch. MMAS, the Mutual Marital Assurance Society, was a radical group started by a female lawyer who sought to punish cheating husbands. Unfortunately, her quest for power went way beyond that objective. Could you explain that a bit for me, Pop? I asked quietly. He sighed heavily before continuing. Trudy isn't Samantha's birth mother, but she's the only mother Sammy has ever really known, Pop began. I knew Trudy was Pop's second wife, but never pressed the issue. I always figured if he wanted to talk about it, he would. And now, he was. Sam's birth mother abandoned us when she was a little girl. I'm sorry to hear that, I told him. He shook his head. Don't be. Patricia, that was her name, got involved with the woman who started that MMAS. Wanted me to help underwrite her operation. She figured I'd be open to it, given some of my charitable and political donations. I met the woman, Mona Larson. Listened to her spew her snake oil. Of course, I refused to help her. I understood her pain, but there was no way I could condone what she wanted to do. Patty, on the other hand, not only condoned it, but wanted to help Mona so much she abandoned us to do it. I hired Bill Jackson to deal with my divorce. She took her maiden name, Witherspoon, and moved to Washington, D.C., to work with Mona. 
Wait, did you say Witherspoon? I asked. Yes, I did. Why? Pop asked. I recall hearing about a Pat Witherspoon who died in custody a few months before I got shot. Was that your first wife? Yes, Pop said quietly. She didn't just die, though. She was murdered. By Mona Larson. I was told she had some kind of poison capsule in her neck. She supposedly got a message from Mona that her services were no longer required. That triggered a hypnotic suggestion that she slap her neck. When she did, the poison capsule broke and she was dead before her body hit the floor. I didn't know all that. I told him. Wasn't my case. It's neither here nor there, Pop said. By then, I had already remarried. Trudy can't have children, but she happily adopted Sammy. He wiped his eyes, then looked at me before speaking again. I know MMAS has a history of going after former agents. It's their way of getting revenge. That's why I asked if you think they're involved in this. It had crossed my mind. But I was under the impression the corporate entity known as MMAS is destroyed. Technically, it is. But there's still a lot of rogue operatives and agents being rounded up, Pop said. I heard they just took a couple of former contractors into custody not that long ago. Damn, I said. I hadn't heard that, but I haven't exactly been in a position where I needed to know. So tell me, how is it you know all this? After Patty left us, I filed for divorce. Bill Jackson still did family law in those days, and he took my case. When I told him what happened, he informed me that he and some others had heard about Larson and her group, Pop said. He had this crazy idea and ran it by me. I liked it and started putting together a funding mechanism. We formed a board, planned everything out. Hell, I put together the funding to purchase that old army base you call Fort Apache. I also lobbied Congress to get federal support. You know the rest, Pop told me. So, when we first met, you already knew about me, I suggested. I knew everything about you, son. Everything, Pop said. Including your reputation as a hard-nosed who doesn't take shit from anyone. So you were just yanking my chain the day we first met, I joked. Pop smiled and nodded his head. It's what I do best, son, he admitted. Besides, I wanted to see if there were any truth to the rumors. So, what are you gonna do now? I have an appointment to see an attorney tomorrow morning. I intend to have the restraining order lifted, then I plan to evict Sam from my house. Restraining order? Pop asked, shocked. She took out a restraining order? Yeah. Can you believe it? Then I'm counterfiling based on adultery. And I plan to invoke the prenuptial you had assigned. If I have my way, someone will go to jail. Jail? Pop asked. The last time I looked, attempted extortion, conspiracy, and perjury are still against the law. So is fabricating evidence. Things have changed over the last seven years, but I don't think they've changed that much. Pop laughed at that. Good luck. Just do me one small favor, if you would, please, Pop said. What's that? I know you have to do what you need to do, but try not to hurt my little girl too much. Please, he begged quietly. I knew what he meant and nodded in understanding. I'll do my level best. I told him. I do have some questions, though, if you don't mind. What's that? What can you tell me about Sam's first husband? I had never asked Samantha about that, figuring it was in the past. Pop sighed heavily and nodded his head. His name is Alvin Morrison. He's an accountant. Last I heard, he worked for a financial services outfit downtown. He and Sam met in college and got married after they graduated. Seemed like a nice enough fella. Bit of a chicken, though, if you ask me, Pop said. What happened? Sam says he cheated on her, Pop answered. Kicked his butt to the curb, filed divorce based on the prenup. I never heard from him after that. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? I asked. Pop's eyes widened, and his brows raised as he looked at me. Now that you mention it, yeah. It does, he finally stated. You think she set him up as well? Don't know until I've had a chance to look into it. But it certainly seems like a possibility, doesn't it? I suppose it does. Which means... At this point, absolutely nothing, I interrupted. I'm just thinking out loud right now, but it is something that needs to be checked out. I agree, Pop said as he stood to leave. Keep me in the loop, if you would. We'll see, Pop, I told him sadly. He seemed to understand, but I could tell he was slightly disappointed in his daughter. We shook hands, and I walked him to the door. He turned to me before leaving. I'm sorry about all this, son, Pop said quietly. This was the first time I had heard him apologize for anything, and I knew it didn't come easy. You're a good man and don't deserve this. I appreciate that, Pop Apology accepted. One last thing, son. Stay in touch, will ya? Of course, I said. To my surprise, he hugged me like a father would a son, then left.
I closed the door, went back to bed, pulled the covers down, and went asleep. The following day, I got up earlier than usual, did my business, dressed, and then gathered my things for the day. I didn't bother checking the surveillance system. I could always look at it when I returned. After grabbing a light breakfast and a fresh caramel mocha, I headed to the office, classic toll keeping me company. My boss, Jack Iverson, the CEO of Iverson Security Services, or ISS, waved me into his office when I arrived. I saw Terry Torres, the head of investigative services, in his office, so I went to Jack's corner office. Morning, Mike, Jack said. I wasn't expecting you in until after your appointment with Alice. I couldn't sleep, so I decided to come on in, I explained. I understand, Jack told me. I took the liberty of briefing Terry on your situation. I hope you don't mind. Not at all. In fact, I have a couple of leads that might be useful. Oh, Terry asked. I learned last night that the man Samantha is cheating on me with his Alan Williams, a partner with the Hempstead Law Group. I couldn't print a picture, but he's on their website. If that doesn't work, you can Google a-hole. Maybe you can get a picture there. Both men laughed at that. That's a start. Anything else? Terry asked. Yeah. I want you to see if you can find an Alvin Morrison. I believe he works for a financial services outfit here in town, I said. And who is he, exactly? Terry asked. He's Samantha's first husband. I want to know everything about their divorce. Should be a public record, so it'll be easy to pull up. I'd appreciate it if you could verify his employment. If he's in town, that should be relatively easy to do, Terry said. Just out of curiosity, though, what are your intentions? I'd like to chat with him about his divorce. I have a feeling this isn't the first time Samantha's played this little game, I said. Terry nodded his head as he made notes. One other thing. I need to know everything you can learn about these photos. I handed Terry one of the pictures from the envelope Allison gave me the previous day. Damn, you don't ask for much, do you, boss? Terry asked sarcastically as he looked at the photo. Jack looked at it after Terry handed it to him. You weren't even in Dallas when this was taken, Jack observed. Assuming this date stamp is correct. No, I wasn't, I replied. The photo could take some time, but I should have some answers on the rest of this for you by the end of the day, Terry told me. Don't worry, Mike. I'll get my best people on this and forward whatever we find to you and Alice. Thanks, Terry. I really appreciate that, I told him. I owe you. He smiled at that. Buy me a cold one, and we'll call it even, he quipped. Well, I'd better get to it. I'll be in touch. Thanks, Terry, Jack said as Terry left. I echoed the sentiment, and Jack motioned for me to close the door. He looked at me, concerned, before speaking. You think this might be a rogue MMAS operation, Mike? You know how those folks are about getting revenge, he said. I don't know, Jack. I thought that at first, but I'm not sure. I did learn one interesting little tidbit, though. What's that? Jack asked. Samantha's birth mother was Pat Witherspoon, one of Ma's top field operatives. That is interesting. She's been dead for quite a while now, from what I've heard. Tell you what I'll do. I'll reach out to Bill Jackson and Oscar Warren and see if they've heard any chatter. Oscar's pretty much the top dog over there at Fort Apache now, Jack said. That's what I heard as well. Tell you what, Mike. You got a good group of people backing you up on this. Let them do the heavy lifting. Meanwhile, take some time off, maybe go fishing or something, Jack said, concerned. I appreciate that, Jack, but I can't just sit on my but while Samantha screws me over, I told him. I understand how you feel, Mike. Really, I do. But maybe you should sit this one out. You're not a field agent anymore, Jack told me. I know, but I can't just sit back and do nothing. I'm just not wired that way. No, you're not, and that's one of the things I admire about you. But you're not much good to me in the shape you're in now, Mike, Jack said. We've got your back. Take some time off anyway. You've earned it. When we learn something, you'll be the first to know. I took in Jack's face and realized he was this close to ordering me to take time off. The professional side of me realized he was right. I needed to back off a bit and decompress. And he was right that I had a good group of people behind me. After thinking about it, I nodded my head in agreement. You're right, Jack, I finally said. I just need to get a few things from my desk before I see Alice. Smart move, Mike, Jack said with a wry smile. Go on, do what you gotta do. We'll be in touch. And keep me in the loop? I will, I told him. Thanks. I went to my office and pulled up my expense report with copies of receipts for the days I was in Seattle. Then I copied the two videos I downloaded to a thumb drive, adjusted my out-of-office email auto-response message, then packed up my stuff. On the way out, I saw Jack smile and nod his head. I smiled back and left. 
I got to the building where Alice Hawkins worked, parked, and went inside. I was about 15 minutes early, but I knew Alice wouldn't mind. I checked in with the receptionist, who directed me to the waiting area. A few minutes later, she escorted me to Alice's office. Good morning, Mr. Jacobs, Alice said as she offered a hand. Mr. Iverson told me to expect you this morning. Would you care for a cup of coffee? The shop on the first floor makes a wonderful caramel mocha. That would be terrific, Ms. Hawkins, I said. Please. I started to pull some money out of my pocket, but Alice stopped me. My treat. Sally, would you mind running down for me, please? Two large caramel mochas, and get yourself something as well, Alice said as she pulled some money from her purse. Of course, Miss Hawkins. Thank you, the pretty, young receptionist said as she took Alice's money. After Sally left, Alice motioned to a chair in front of her desk, and I sat down. Mr. Iverson tells me you've been served with divorce papers, Alice said. That's correct, Miss Hawkins, I replied. Please call me Alice. Do you have the papers with you? Yes, I do, I told her, opening my briefcase. I grabbed the envelope and handed it to her. Alice looked through the papers, frowning as she did so. When she finished, she set the papers down and looked at me with a scowl. There are some fairly serious charges being made here, Alice finally said through gritted teeth. Is there any evidence of infidelity? Because if there is, you should know that I do not represent cheaters. There is evidence, but none that will implicate me. If you're interested, I'll show you. If not, I'll find someone more objective to handle my case. I told her sternly. She seemed to shrink a bit at that. By all means, Mr. Jacobs, show me. I handed her the envelope of photos and watched her eyes widen as she scanned through them. She shook her head and looked at me when she finished. Can you dispute this? Absolutely, I told her, standing up with the help of my cane. Alice looked shocked as I unfastened my belt and dropped my trousers. Mr. Jacobs, please. That isn't necessary, she said. I'll be the judge of what's necessary, I growled. Then her eyes fell on my right thigh, now exposed. Oh my, she sighed in shock. I damn near lost this leg in the service of my country. Spent months in the hospital going through surgery and physical therapy, learning to walk all over again. I hissed. I still can't put my weight on that knee like the man in those photos did. Do you believe me now, Miss Hawkins? Or do I take my business down the street? You're alleging these photos were fabricated? Alice asked. I'm not alleging anything, Miss Hawkins. I'm telling you flat out, those photos are fabricated. On top of that, I have expense reports and receipts proving I was in Seattle, Washington when those photos were taken. I'm good, but not even I can be in two places at once. Now, tell me, will you represent me, or do I go somewhere else? I'll take your case, Mr. Jacobs, Alice finally said, handing the photos back. Now, please, pull your pants back up. I pulled my trousers back up and fastened my belt when Sally returned with our coffee. She looked at me, confused. Is everything all right? She asked. Just proving a point. Everything is fine, I told her before taking my seat. Sally looked at Alice for confirmation. Everything is fine, Sally. Thank you, she said as Sally handed over the change from the coffee purchases. Sally smiled, then left the office. Alice looked at me before taking a sip of coffee. I'm sorry for doubting you, Mr. Jacobs. I hope we won't have to go through that again. Please call me Mike, and I accept your apology. I hope I won't have to drop true in the courtroom, but I will if I have to prove the point, I told her. Alice smiled at that. I see your reputation precedes you, Mike. And no, I doubt you'll have to do that. But in all fairness, it's nice to know you're willing to go the extra mile if necessary. What else do you have for me? I pulled out my phone and showed Alice the video I took of my confrontation with Allison. She frowned as she watched the video, then handed the phone back. So, your wife has retained Allison Cartwright, Alice said. She has quite the reputation as well. Ethics doesn't seem to be an obstacle for her, according to this video. I'd like a copy of that, please. It'll come in handy when I file my complaint against her. Complaint? Yes. That video shows several ethics violations and at least one possible criminal act. Plus, she accompanied you to your house without a police escort, and that's highly unusual. What else do you have? I handed her the thumb drive with the two videos I took from my surveillance system. Alice looked at both of those, a smile forming on her face. Well? I asked. More fuel for my complaint, Alice said. What's this about pulling a gun on Ms. Cartwright? Did you really pull a gun on an officer of the court? Yes, I did. Why? Alice asked. She nodded her head as I explained my experiences in the task force. And you thought that maybe your wife and or Ms. Cartwright had something, 
Or someone waiting to ambush and drug or assault you? Something like that, yeah, I said. In fact, I was shot in a very similar situation. I see, Alice said. Fortunately for you, Mike, I'm familiar with the task force, and I'm familiar with some of the tactics used by MMAS. I've represented quite a few of the men your task force has helped. I'm sure Ms. Cartwright will try to make an issue of it. Don't worry. I've got it under control. Thank you, I said. So let me see if I have this right. You own the house you shared with Samantha, correct? Yes. It was passed down to me from my grandparents long before I ever met Samantha, I explained. What about your bank accounts? Samantha removed 80% of our accounts, and Allison had them frozen. Alice looked at me, shocked. She froze the accounts after your wife took 80%? Correct, I said. There was no real reason for that other than just plain vindictiveness and an attempt to slow you down, keep you from retaining legal services, Alice said. Why are they doing all of this to you? Now that's the $64,000 question, isn't it, counselor? I asked sarcastically. Hopefully, your company's investigators can come up with some answers, Alice said. Yes, Mr. Iverson informed me that Mr. Torres will be working the case. I look forward to what he finds out. As do I, I told her. First things first. I need to get that restraining order lifted and get you back into your house. Then I need to get your assets returned. In the meantime, I'll answer this petition with one of our own. Do you have a copy of your prenuptial agreement? Yes, I do, I told her, pulling it out of my briefcase. Alice looked it over, set it aside, and handed me a checklist. It will probably take me a couple days to get this ironed out. Do what you can on that checklist. Are you set for funds until we get the money back into your account? Yes, I'll be okay, I told her. All right, Mike. I've got it from here. I shouldn't have to remind you not to do anything stupid in the meantime, but I'm going to anyway. I don't want to have to bail you out of jail. No problem, Alice. I told her with a chuckle. I've got it under control. No, you don't, she remarked. At least not yet. Your cheating swine of a wife has just served you with divorce papers, falsely accused you of adultery based on fabricated evidence, kicked you out of your house, stolen a good chunk of money, and wants to steal most of your assets as well. And that's just for starters. But we will get things under control. We exchanged contact information, then ended the meeting. On the way out, I stopped at Sally's desk and paid a healthy retainer. Then I left, feeling like I had some control over things. I stopped for lunch and received a call between bites of my cheeseburger. I saw it was from Jack, so I took the call. How did things go with Alice? He asked. Went well, I answered. I hope to see something happen real soon. Good, Jack responded. I spoke with Bill and Oscar. They're not aware of anything at the moment, but Oscar said he'll be by to see you later this afternoon or this evening. I suspect he'll want some background. I told him where you're hanging out. No problem. I'm sure he does, I said. Anything else? Terry has some info for you. He's sending you an email with his summary so far. Don't want to say too much over the phone, but I will tell you this. Turns out Ms. Cartwright handled Samantha's first divorce as well. Interesting, I said. I thought you might say that, Jack said. Anyway, I can't hear the television in the background. You at that new sports bar and grill? Yeah, chowing down on a mega cheeseburger, I told him. Not bad, actually. Maybe I'll try it one of these days, Jack said. You take care of yourself, and I don't want to see you in here tomorrow. Got it? Got it, boss, I responded. Good. By the way, good job on that monthly report. Looks like things are improving out west. Thanks, I noticed that as well. All right, I'll let you go. Talk to you soon, Mike. We ended the call, and I turned back to my burger. I was nearly finished when my phone buzzed. I saw a text from Terry, Alvin Morrison, financial planner, Tri-State's Financial Services, followed by an address close by and a phone number. I acknowledged the text and received an almost immediate reply. More to come. Stand by. We'll email. Thanks, I wrote back. That was fast. We're the best boss, he replied. I gave his message a thumbs up emoji and called Alvin's number. To my amazement, he answered after the first ring. Thank you for calling Tri-State's financial services the best in the business. I am Alvin Morrison. How can I help secure your financial future today? I was momentarily taken aback. At first, I thought this was a recording, but then I realized it was an actual person. Yes, my name is Mike Jacobs. I'd like to speak with you as soon as possible, I answered. Absolutely, Mr. Jacobs. I'd love to meet you, Alvin said. I just so happened to have an opening at 1 p.m. Would that work for you? I looked at my watch before answering. That would give me roughly an hour, 
assuming I could finish my burger in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, yes, that would be perfect. I'll see you at 1 p.m. Thanks, I said. I look forward to seeing you, Mr. Jacobs, Alvin cheerfully said before we ended the call. I did a quick Google search to see how much guys like Alvin made in an hour and made a mental note of it. I had no intention of purchasing any of his services at the moment. Still, I decided I would compensate him for his time and whatever information he could provide. Wrapping up my lunch, I headed out. As I drove out of the parking lot, I heard a line from an old toll song on my car stereo. The witch's promise was coming. Believing he listened while laughing, you flew? You got that shit right, Ian, I said to no one in particular. I finally got to the building where Alvin worked, parked the car, and went inside. I introduced myself to the receptionist, who escorted me to Alvin's office. I saw a reasonably tall, lanky man a few years younger than me in a business suit, white shirt, and tie. He smiled as he stood and shook my hand. Good afternoon, Mr. Jacobs, he said in greeting. Would you care for a cup of coffee? Of course, I said, sitting down. The receptionist asked how I liked my coffee, then left and returned a few moments later with a steaming mug of coffee. I thanked her and took a sip, finding the hot brew sufficiently flavored. So, Mr. Jacobs, what can I do for you today? Are you looking to invest or possibly set up a retirement portfolio? We offer some of the best packages in the business, and I can assure you a good return on your investments, Alvin cheerfully stated, smiling the whole time. I wondered if the smile had been surgically implanted on his face. Please, call me Mike, I said, hoping to put him at ease before launching into the real reason for my visit. Okay, Mike, and feel free to call me Alvin, he said with his constant smile. Thank you, Alvin, I responded, almost feeling wrong about what I would do next. I'm sorry to say, I'm not here to purchase any of your products. I'm here to ask about your divorce from Samantha Green. Alvin's smile disappeared, and his face went dark. I'm sorry, Mr. Jacobs, but that's not open for discussion. I'm afraid I'll have to ask that you leave now, Alvin growled. I pulled the small stack of $100 bills from my pocket and counted off three bills as his eyes grew wide. I understand this is a sore subject for you, Alvin. I intend to compensate you for your time and whatever information you can provide. I believe financial planners in this area make about $40 an hour. I'm willing to pay you $300 for the same amount of time, I responded, holding three $100 bills in my hand. I saw him look at the money as he considered my offer. Then his demeanor softened. That's very generous of you, Mike, he finally said. Just one question before I decide whether or not to accept your offer. Anything, I told him. Are you a private investigator or a law enforcement officer? I'm not. I used to be a federal agent, but that was a long time ago. Before this, I said, pointing to my leg. He looked where I pointed and at the cane. Then he nodded his head. All right, he said. I accept your offer. I handed him the bills. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you mind if I record this conversation? I want to make sure I get everything right. That's fine, he said, shrugging his shoulders. I pulled out my phone and started the audio recorder app. Interview with Alvin Morrison, I said into the recorder, adding the date and the time. So, Alvin, what can you tell me? Not much to tell, really, he began. I met Samantha in college. We shared a few classes and I was attracted to her. We dated, fell in love. You know, all the usual stuff. We married right out of college. She took me to see her father. Jacob Green? I asked. Yeah, him. He hated me from the very beginning. I know he's rich and all, but I never imagined he would be so brash. Profane. Actually, I chuckled at that. Anyway, things went well for about five years. We were talking about having children and buying a house. Basically, all the stuff young married couples talk about. I came home from work one day and saw her at the kitchen table with another woman. At first, I thought she was a friend of Samantha's from that law firm she worked for. Would that be Hempstead? I asked. Alvin nodded. Yes, that would be the one. Anyway, I walked into the kitchen and said hello. The other woman handed me an envelope and said I was served. I looked and saw Samantha was accusing me of infidelity. Did you ever cheat on her? Never. I loved Samantha with all my heart. I know I'm not the most attractive guy nor the strongest, but I loved her, and I would never do anything to hurt her. All right, did they have proof of this alleged infidelity? I asked. The other woman I learned was Samantha's attorney handed me a smaller envelope full of photographs, claimed she had even more, along with a video, threatened to send them out to my friends, family, and even the people I work with, unless I signed the papers right then and there. Of course, I refused to sign them until I had a chance to see an attorney. Samantha also had a restraining order 
and said I had to leave right then. She even had a lot of my stuff already packed. Her lawyer told me she had other evidence against me and threatened to use it if I didn't sign. I left and tried to check into a motel but found none of my cards worked. That's when I learned that Samantha cleaned out our accounts. We had over $100,000 saved up, but it was all gone. I ended up staying with my parents. They loaned me enough to see a lawyer, but he was basically worthless. I went back to the condo to get more of my things and hopefully talk some sense into Samantha. I forgot about the restraining order. Anyway, she was in bed with some pig when I got there. I lost it and went after him, but he was a whole lot bigger than me. He kicked my butt and beat me so bad that I had to be taken to the hospital in an ambulance. When I woke up, I found myself handcuffed to the bed. That's when I was told I was under arrest for violating a restraining order and possessing illegal spicy videos. After I was discharged from the hospital, I was taken to jail. The detective working the case discovered the images on my phone were placed there after I was knocked unconscious. So, the charges were dropped, but the damage was already done. I was fired from my job, basically, my whole life went down the toilet. What about the charge of violating the restraining order? Turns out that was fabricated as well. There was no restraining order, and the paper Samantha's lawyer gave me hadn't been filed with the court. But that didn't matter. I still ended up spending a weekend in jail, Alvin spit. What then? They proceeded to destroy me every way they could, Alvin hissed. By the time it was over, I had nothing. I was broke, out of a job, but still expected to pay maintenance and the mortgage on the condo. I took whatever job I could get just to keep my head above water. I finally got on here, and I'm just now beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. Do you still have the pictures they gave you of your alleged adultery? I asked. Yes, as a matter of fact, I do, Alvin said, opening his briefcase. He pulled out a small, tattered envelope and handed it to me. You keep them in your briefcase? I asked, surprised. I still live with my parents, and I'd be mortified if they ever saw them. I keep meaning to throw them away, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I nodded in understanding, then looked through the pictures, and what I saw shocked me. The background and the poses depicted were exactly like the photos Allison handed me. Even the woman in the pictures looked to be the same person. There were only two things different in this set of images. First, the date and time stamps were different, and second, the man in this set of photographs looked shorter and somewhat thinner. Other than that, they appeared identical. Would you mind if I keep these for a while? I know someone who can analyze these photographs. You can keep them, for all I care, Alvin said. Thank you, I said. Tell me, have you considered taking legal action against your ex-wife and her attorney? I spoke to a couple lawyers, but they said there was nothing they could do. Apparently, I didn't make enough money for their tastes. I see. How are you holding up now? I was a basket case for years. I haven't even dated a woman since this happened. As you can imagine, I have a lot of issues with trust. And I'm still trying to dig my way out of debt. At least you don't have alimony or the mortgage on your condo to deal with anymore. I told him, hoping to give him a slight ray of hope. My statement was met with an expression of shock mixed with confusion. What are you talking about? He asked. I've been paying that woman nearly $3,000 a month to cover alimony and the mortgage on the condo I used to live in for almost eight years. I still have just over two years of alimony and another 18 years on the mortgage. Weren't you informed that Samantha remarried about six years ago and that she sold that condo about the same time? I asked. No, Alvin declared, shaking his head. No one said anything. Samantha's attorney had it taken right out of my pay and deposited in an account for Samantha. I quickly did the math and figured Samantha owed this poor guy just over $210,000. There was another issue, and I realized Terry would need to look into Samantha's financial records. There was an account in her name with a ton of money somewhere. Perhaps she was splitting the money she extorted from Alvin with Allison. Can you contact your HR department and have them get you the information on where that money is being sent? I asked. I'll ask, Alvin said. What if they refuse to give it to me? Then I'll ask my lawyer to file a subpoena for that information. Something about this is very fishy. I'm no lawyer, Alvin, but it sounds to me like you have a serious case against your ex-wife and her attorney. How do you know this? Alvin asked. Because. Samantha pulled something very similar to me just yesterday, I said. Would you be willing to testify to this in court? Absolutely, Alvin snarled. You think she could go to jail for this? I think that's a definite possibility, I answered. Then hell yes, I'll testify, Alvin said. I'll have my lawyer get in touch with you, Alvin, if you're okay with that. I'm more than okay with that, Alvin responded. I nodded my head and stood with the help of my cane. 
Alvin stood with me and offered his hand, which I accepted. We'll be in touch, I told him. I left and headed for my hotel room. When I got there, I pulled out the photos Alvin gave me and compared them to the images I had. Sure enough, they were nearly identical. I grabbed my phone and called Terry. Torres, he said when he answered. Terry, are you anywhere near my hotel? I asked. I can be there in about an hour, he said. What's up? I got a little challenge for you. You know me. I'm always up to a challenge, Terry responded. I could hear the smile in his voice. Good. I need you to come by my room at the hotel. I have something for you to check out. On my way, Terry said. We ended the call, and I checked my home surveillance system. So far, nothing new had been saved since Samantha and Alan left this morning. I pulled my phone and made a call to Alice. Yes, Mr. Jacobs? She asked when she picked up the phone. I told her about my meeting with Alvin and heard her gasp in surprise. I've checked and I can assure you the restraining order against you is very real. But I definitely want to speak with Mr. Morrison. We ended the call after I gave her Alvin's contact information. By then, Terry was knocking on my door. What's up, boss? He asked when I let him inside. I showed him the pictures Alvin gave me, and he appeared shocked as he looked at them. Can you explain this? I asked. I've heard about this, but I've never actually seen anyone get away with it, Terry said as he compared the two photos. Heard about what? I asked. Deep fake photos, Terry said. Basically, someone with the right skills could create fake photos and videos, and they would be very difficult to disprove. In this case, it seems whoever did this is using the same background and the same two human forms to create fake images of spouses having sex. Pretty lazy if you ask me. You think we can prove these are fakes to a judge? I asked. Yeah, I know some photo experts who could probably take these apart, but it would be easier if we had the originals, which I suspect are digital. All right, take a couple from each batch and see what you can find out for me, I told him. Anything else? Yeah, I looked into Williams for you. He joined Hempstead not too long ago and came here from New York. Get this, he's married with two kids. Terry showed me a family portrait. There he was, Alan, a pretty blonde woman, and two good-looking young children, probably not more than seven years old. For a lawyer, he's awful stupid. Cheating on a beautiful family like this, I said. Tell me about it. Her name is Rhonda. She's a state representative, heir to a fairly wealthy man. Which means she's still in New York, and I'll bet you a dollar to a donut hole there's a prenup involved, I said. Yup, on both counts, Terry said. I couldn't help but smile. Oh yeah, Alan Williams would pay dearly. What else? I asked Terry. I looked into Morrison's divorce like you asked. Pretty straightforward, according to the paperwork. Samantha filed for divorce based on adultery. The terms and conditions of the prenuptial were enforced, and she got a healthy order for 10 years of spousal support, unless she remarried, and Alvin was ordered to pay the mortgage on their condo, Terry said. The order does stipulate that if the condo is sold, the proceeds are to be split equally between the two parties, he added. So he's been paying Samantha for a mortgage that no longer exists and paying support to someone who doesn't deserve it. Any idea where the money is going? I asked. Cartwright set up a separate account and had the funds automatically taken out of Morrison's paychecks, Terry said. I wasn't able to find any information on that account. Personally, I don't know how Morrison managed to survive all this time on what was left. At least they didn't have children. If I can get you the account information, can you look into it, find out how much she's got in it? Of course, but to be honest, it may very well take a court order or a subpoena to get any details, Terry explained. Do what you have to do. Get with Alice if you need something legal. I assume you've already provided all this to her. I have, Terry acknowledged. And I'm sure you have people tailing Samantha? Of course, you know they have people watching you as well? I figured that, I admitted. Frankly, I don't give a shit. Let them waste their time and money following me. Terry chuckled at that. Well, I'd better get back to it. I'll send you an email with what I have so far, he said. Sounds like a plan. I look forward to your report, I told him as I shook his hand. And good work, Terry. He smiled at the compliment. Thanks, boss. That means a lot, he said. I noticed the extra spring in his step as he left the room and smiled. Terry was a good man, and I meant what I said. I sat down at my laptop and logged into the home surveillance system, but there wasn't anything new. So I sat back on the bed, watched television, and considered my next actions. I hated not being able to do anything but wait on other people. I had always been a man who took point on everything, and this waiting was killing me. Sometime later, I heard a knock at the door. Grabbing my pistol and cane, I got off the bed and went for the door. Who's there? I called out. 
Oscar Warren, a man's voice said from the other side. I looked through the peephole and saw him holding up his credentials. Proby? Is that really you? That's Special Agent Proby to you, Mr. Jacobs, Oscar said good-naturedly. I cracked the door and saw his smiling face. He was a bit older than the last time I saw him, but he still looked in good shape. I opened the door and let him come in. Good to see you, Oscar, I said, lowering the pistol. Good to see you as well, you old dog, he laughed. I hope you remember how to make that thing safe. I chuckled at that. I think I can manage. Looks like they'll make anyone a special agent these days, I joked. Well, technically, I'm actually a deputy assistant special agent in charge, but I'm okay with just special agent. So, I hear you're a big-time executive these days. Yeah, so they tell me, I quipped. So, what brings you all the way out here from Fort Apache? You remember the name Pat Witherspoon? That's a name I hadn't heard in ages. You know, she was the one who turned my first wife. The one who told me what my punishment would be if I ever cheated on Renee. She died in my custody when Mona Larson played her little Jedi mind trick. All these years I never knew she was Jake Green's ex-wife. And here you are, married to her daughter. I had no idea. I told him. No, of course you didn't. None of us knew her family ties at the time, Oscar said. We ended up cremating her body after the autopsy. No one would even claim her body. Kinda sad, don't you think? Given who she was associated with, all the pain and suffering she caused, no, I don't. As far as I'm concerned, she was the one who killed Renee with her drugs and her games, Oscar said bitterly. And I still have a hospital full of her victims. Men who will probably never recover from the abuse and torture Pat's goons inflicted on them. You were there, Mike. You saw your share. Got shot by one of them, remember? I'll never forget, I said quietly. Do you think her daughter is following in her footsteps? Oscar asked. I don't know. She doesn't exactly fit the profile. A lot of the old profiles don't work anymore, Mike. It's a whole new ball game these days. They don't even call themselves MMAs. They prefer to use terms like sisterhood. You ever hear Samantha or her lawyer use that phrase? No, never, I answered. Let me know if you do, okay? Oscar pleaded. Sure, I said. Like I said, Samantha doesn't exactly fit the old profiles. But that lawyer of hers, Allison Cartwright, she definitely could. Cartwright. I don't recall that name, Oscar mused. Tell you what I'll do. I'll have Wiseman and his research team do a deep dive, see what they come up with. He's still working for the task force? Oh yeah, Oscar exclaimed. That is when he and his wife aren't scaring the shit out of wannabe Lotharios. I think Amy's been hit on by just about every manager in that company she works for. I chuckled at that. I've met Ron Wiseman before and watched him and his wife use their wheel of death. He even showed me a few tricks with his knives. To quote Mr. T, I pitted the fools who tried to hit on Amy. So, what's going on? Anything new since I spoke with your boss? Oscar asked, and I filled him in on what I had learned since this morning. He seemed especially interested when I told him about the photos. I can't help but wonder if maybe this Cartwright has done this to others besides you and Morrison, Oscar said. I'll pass that on to Wiseman. Definitely sounds like a crime, or two has been committed here. May not rise to the level of task force involvement, but I certainly think someone's going to jail. I'll get Wiseman on it right away, and let you know what he finds. Thanks, Oscar. I appreciate it a bunch, I said. What are friends for? Oscar responded with a smile. Well, I'd better get back. Rita's making a pot roast, and it'll be my, but if I'm not home in time for dinner. That's right. You married the boss daughter. I thought you'd gained a few pounds since the last time I saw you. How are things going? Wonderful. Oscar said. I haven't been this happy in years. Well, you give her and the kids my best, I told him. I'll do that, Mike, thanks, Oscar said as he stood up. No, thank you, my friend, I told him as we shook hands. I walked him to the door, and we said our final goodbyes. I looked at the time and decided to grab some dinner, so I grabbed my cane and went to the restaurant downstairs. After a tasty filet mignon, I bought a cigar from the gift shop, sat out by the pool with an after-dinner drink, and relaxed. I returned to my room a couple hours later, feeling somewhat relaxed. After looking at the time, I figured Samantha would be home. So I washed up, booted my laptop, and logged into my home surveillance system. Sam had just walked into the house with Alan and Allison. So, what's so important that you couldn't tell me at the office? Samantha asked Allison. I got a report from the PI. Your husband went to see Alice Hawkins this morning, Allison told her. So? He went to see a lawyer. We knew he would. You don't understand, Samantha. Alice is a shark, 
and the first thing she's going to do is get that restraining order reversed. And if I know her, she'll be looking for blood. There's more. Mike spoke to your ex-husband early this afternoon, Allison said. I saw Samantha's face turn white. What do you think Alvin told him? Samantha asked, now panicked. My guess is everything, Allison said. And if your husband puts it together, we could be in big trouble. There's more. I spoke to my contact, and she tells me Mike served on something called the Home Front Security Task Force. A real badass. He wasn't kidding when he told your father he killed people, she added, causing Samantha to shrink back. In fact, he received several medals for his work, Allison continued. I also heard from the PI that he was visited today by one of his old colleagues, someone named Oscar Warren. I don't know what they talked about, but I can make an educated guess. Again, why is that so important? Samantha asked, still confused. If your husband has the resources of a federal agency that specializes in family disputes behind him, we're royally screwed, Allison said. Maybe now is the time to set Mike up, Alan said. I still have that drive. Lots of juicy stuff on here. Can you imagine what'll happen when the authorities learn that a former federal agent has a computer full of illegal spicy videos? Forget it, Alan, Allison said. It's too late to plant anything on his hard drive now. He hasn't had access to his computer for nearly 24 hours. A forensic tech could spot that in a minute. All right, then I'll email it to him, Alan said. That might work, Allison said. But you need to be very careful. Make sure he can't track it back to your computer. What about the account? Samantha asked. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars in that account. I'll deal with that, Allison said. What if all this doesn't work? Samantha asked fear etched in her voice. There's too much at stake here. If this doesn't work, and if we can't bring Mike to heel, we'll have no choice but to make sure he has an accident. One he never wakes up from, Allison told her firmly. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Samantha slowly nodded her head, understanding the implication of Allison's statement. And do you understand, Alan? Yeah, I get it, he told her. I understood as well. The three of them intended to kill me if all else failed. The woman I had pledged my life and my love to had just agreed to see me dead all for the love of money. She, of all people, should have known that I don't like to lose an argument. And I sure as hell wasn't about to lose this one. I pulled out my phone and made my first call to Ryan Harper, an old friend of mine in the FBI. Special Agent Harper, he said when he answered. Ryan, this is Mike Jacobs, I said. How'd you like an exclusive? Mike, you crusty old dog. I was just thinking about you, Ryan said. What's this exclusive you have for me? conspiracy to commit murder and extortion, for starters, I told him. Oh yeah? Who's the victim? Me. You? Are you sure of this? Ryan asked, shocked. Absolutely, I told him. I have them on video. You want me to send it to you? Send it to me now, and I'll call Sheriff Pratt. We're old buddies from way back. You have my email address, right? I have it in my contact list. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that, I said as I prepared to send the video clip. After I formatted the email, I hit send. It's on its way to you now. I see it, Ryan responded a few moments later. I could hear the muffled sound of the video playing through my phone. Shit, I can't believe Samantha would do that to you. Hang on, let me call the sheriff. I heard him talking to someone on another phone for a few minutes, then he returned. Okay, Sheriff Pratt is sending someone to your place now. What the hell's going on? Ryan listened quietly as I relayed the events of the last couple days. I heard him whistle when I finished. Damn, that's just cold-blooded, he exclaimed. I thought so. I told him. Where are you now? Are you safe? Do I need to send someone to cover you? Ryan asked, concerned. I gave him my location and assured him I would be alright. He responded when I finished. Well, this doesn't look like a federal case, at least not yet. But if you need anything, give me a call. You hear me, Mike? I got it. But thanks again, Ryan. I appreciate it. We ended the call, and I looked at my laptop to see the three conspirators still talking. What about the ex? Do we kill him, too? Alan asked. No, at least not yet. It would look too suspicious for two of Samantha's husbands to be killed so soon. Tomorrow, I'll start moving the funds we've been collecting from him and the others to an offshore account. Once that's finished, we'll reevaluate Alvin's usefulness. So, I thought, there are other victims. This should prove to be interesting. You sound like you've done this before. Alan said. Allison smirked before responding. Let's just say this isn't exactly my first rodeo, she quipped. I watched them chatter on for about a half hour, then saw the reflection of flashing lights outside. I smiled, 
knowing their little plot was about to get a monkey wrench thrown into it. A few moments later, I heard a knocking at the door. Sheriff's Department. Open up, I heard a man's voice call out. Samantha, Allison and Alan looked at each other, confused. You'd better open the door, Allison told Samantha. Sam followed Allison's direction and opened the door. Yes? Samantha asked. Samantha Jacobs? The deputy asked. That's me, Samantha said. Deputy Smith. This is Deputy Jones. May we come inside, please? Ah, uh, of course, Deputy, Samantha said. Two deputies entered the front room, one male and one female. Alan Williams? Allison Cartwright? Smith asked. The other two nodded their heads. We're here to take you three into custody. You're under arrest. Turn around. Hands behind your back. Under arrest? For what? Allison asked. According to the warrant, conspiracy to commit murder and extortion, Smith said. Sam, Allison and Alan looked at each other confused as Smith read their Miranda rights. How? Shut up, Alan, Allison hissed. Say nothing. To no one. Got it. Your husband must have planted some bugs in the house, Alan told Samantha. Did you know about that? No, I didn't, Samantha said. Shut up, both of you, Allison commanded. Say nothing. When we get to the county jail, I'll arrange for our representation. You have the right to remain silent, so use it. The deputies finished their work and escorted the three conspirators out of my house. The video ended when the door closed. I grabbed my phone and placed my second call, this time to Alice Hawkins, my lawyer. What's happened, Mike? Why are you calling me after hours? I just wanted to let you know Sam and her two conspirators have been arrested, I answered. Arrested? For what? Conspiracy to commit murder and extortion. I have their plot captured on video, I told Alice. Oh my God, Alice exclaimed. Can you get me a copy of that video? Already on it, I said as I prepared to email the video. Well, this will certainly help out when I go to see Judge Banks about the restraining order, Alice told me. Would that be Judge Kenneth Banks? I asked. One and the same. Why? Do you know him? I ran an intervention on his behalf about 10 years ago, I explained. Intervention was the term we used in the task force for helping targeted husbands. Before he became a judge, I added. Couldn't that be seen as a conflict of interest? Have you done anything on his behalf since then? Alice asked. No, I told her. Then it shouldn't be an issue. Chances are he may not even remember your name, Alice said. Maybe. I doubt that he forgot the intervention, though. Well, don't worry about it. If he asks, then I'll tell him. Otherwise, we won't say anything, she told me. When do you go before him? I asked Alice. Tomorrow afternoon. One o'clock. I also have a motion to unfreeze your accounts along with the demand that Samantha return at least 35% of everything she took. I'll be arguing those in front of Judge Banks at that time. Hopefully, with Samantha in custody, I'll have good news for you by this time tomorrow. I look forward to that, I told Alice. As do I. Get a good night's sleep, Mike. I'll talk to you tomorrow. We ended the call and I placed my third call of the evening, this time to Wilson Langley, Samantha's boss. He also happened to be Allison and Alan's boss as well. Since I was responsible for getting Langley's business, I had his personal cell number in my contacts. I only had reason to call him on this number once since he signed on with ISS. Langley, the older man answered after the first ring. Mr. Langley, this is Mike Jacobs, ISS. How are you this evening, sir? I was enjoying a nice steak dinner with some friends, he said. I could hear the background noise indicating he was probably at the country club, where Pop often ate. What can I do for you, Mr. Jacobs? Is there a problem with the security at my office building? None that I'm aware of, Mr. Langley. But there is a problem with three of your employees. Oh, what kind of problem? A legal one. They've been arrested, I told him. They're on their way to the county jail as we speak. What? Langley hissed. I could tell he covered the phone as he spoke to his dinner guests. Then he turned his attention back to me. Hang on, let me go somewhere a bit quieter. I could hear him leave the table and waited for him to speak, which only took a few moments. What's going on, Mr. Jacobs? As you know, my wife, Samantha, your executive assistant, has filed divorce papers against me, I explained. Yes, I'm aware of that. I have video of her, Alan Williams and Allison Cartwright, plotting to murder me. I also have evidence of them conspiring to extort me as well, I told him calmly. Given our business relationship, I felt I owed it to you to let you know. Damn, he spit. You say you have proof of this? Yes, sir, I have video, taken in my own home. 
I have reason to believe there's more to the story and I intend to get to the bottom of this. Do you suspect me or my firm of any illegalities? Langley asked quietly. I have no direct evidence of that, Mr. Langley. Not at this time. But all three of the perps in this case do work for you. I told him calmly. Yes, so it seems. At least for the moment. But everyone is entitled to a defense, Mr. Jacobs. They'll get their day in court, just like everyone else. And if it turns out your allegations are true, then I'll fire them. Is that sufficient? He asked. Yes, that will suffice, Mr. Langley, I said. Good. And thank you for bringing this to my attention, Mr. Jacobs. You're welcome, I said, ending the call. There was one more call to make. I looked at the information Terry gave me about Alan Williams and made my next move. I dialed the New York number for Alan and Rhonda Williams, hoping Alan's wife would answer the phone. I heard a woman's voice after two rings. Williams residence, she said. I'd like to speak with Rhonda Williams, please, I said. This is she, the woman replied. Mrs. Williams, my name is Mike Jacobs. I have some bad news regarding your husband, Alan. I heard her sigh before speaking. What's my husband done now? She asked quietly. Your husband has been sleeping with my wife, I told her. You have ironclad proof of this? I have video of them together. Damn him, Rhonda hissed. I warned him if this happened again. We were through. There's more, Mrs. Williams, I said. Please call me Rhonda, she said. You say there's more? Yes, Rhonda. And please call me Mike. Your husband has been arrested for conspiracy to commit murder and extortion. I have a feeling more charges will be forthcoming. He and his two conspirators are being taken to the county jail even now, I said. Oh my God, Rhonda whispered sadly. I'm really very sorry about all this. It's not your fault, Rhonda. He made his choices. Now he'll have to live with them. Yes, of course. You're right. You say you have evidence. Can you send that to me, please? Of course, I told her. Rhonda gave me her personal email address, and I added it to my contacts. I'll send you what I have as soon as we get off the phone. Again, I'm sorry about this. Like you said, Mike, it's not your fault. Alan made his bed. Now he'll have to lie in it. Thank you for letting me know, Rhonda said sadly. I felt bad for her and her children. I knew the media shitstorm they would have to deal with as a result of Alan's actions. We ended the call and I followed through with my promise. I sent her all the videos I had involving Alan with a short note of condolence. I had one more call to make and I knew this would be the hardest. Picking up my phone, I called Pop, who answered after the second ring. Sam's been arrested, I said quietly. Yes, I know. She called me from the county jail, Pop said. I could hear the sadness in his voice. She says they're charging her with conspiracy to commit murder. Is it true? I'm afraid it is, Pop, I responded. I have it on video. I can't believe she would go along with something like that, Pop sighed. She did, Pop. Anyway, it's in the hands of the authorities now. Who else knows? Pop asked. Her boss, Wilson Langley. I just told him a few minutes ago. I also spoke to Alan Williams' wife in New York. And my lawyer. You know this is gonna cause a media shit show, Pop said. Probably, I said. Shit like this usually does. Pop chuckled at that. We'll get through it, Pop finally said. Thanks for letting me know. You're welcome, I responded. I felt bad for the old guy, realizing that he wasn't responsible for what his daughter had done. Well, I'd best get going, Pop finally said. Let me know if you hear anything. All right, Pop. Have a good evening. Give my best to Mom, I said before ending the call. Looking out the sliding glass doors that led to the balcony, I saw the sun had gone down and observed the twinkling lights of the city. I felt somewhat relieved at the events of the day and wanted to do something. Anything. I felt like checking out and going back to my home, but remembered the restraining order was still in effect. I would not be surprised if Allison's private investigators were watching to see if I would try to sneak back once the conspirators had been taken away. Feeling about of cabin fever. I simply had get out of that room before I went nuts. So I went downstairs, bought another cigar and planted myself by the pool to enjoy the cool night air, a drink, and a smoke. After a couple hours, I came back to the room, crawled under the covers and slept like a baby. I woke up later than usual the following morning. So I got up, showered, shaved, and did my normal business before going downstairs for some breakfast. I didn't have anything on my plate for the day, other than waiting for news from Alice. So I took a nice, leisurely stroll around the downtown area before going back to my room. The knock came after I had only been back a few moments. Not expecting anyone to show up, I grabbed my pistol and peered through the peephole. I saw two men in cheap suits, badges on their belts. Who is it? I queried. 
Police Department, Mr. Jacobs. We'd like a word, please. I heard a man respond. Hold your credentials up so I can see them, I demanded. Not just your badges. They looked at each other, shrugged their shoulders, and held up their official police credentials. Reading their box tops, I learned they were Detectives Johnson and Carraway. I had met Johnson a few years back at a fundraiser supporting widows and orphans of officers killed in the line of duty. I had never personally met Carraway, but I knew of his reputation. I decided to take a chance they were the real deal and holstered my weapon. Just a second, I told them. Cracking the door open, I surveyed the hall in both directions, then invited them inside. Just so you know, there is a loaded weapon in the room, I told them. It's holstered and has been rendered safe. We expected as much, Mr. Jacobs, one of the detectives said. We know you're a former federal agent, and we also know you have a permit to carry. We just have a few questions regarding your wife and a couple of her colleagues. All right, come on in. Care for some coffee? Sure. Black, please, Detective Johnson said. Caraway echoed his statement, so I poured them each a cup of the hot black brew. They took a tentative sip before curling their lips in disgust. Damn, you call this shit coffee? Caraway asked. That's what it says on the package, I told him. Tastes fine to me. Yeah, you're a former Fed, all right, Johnson quipped with a wry smile. I invited them to take a seat before sitting on the bed. So, what can I do for the city's finest? I asked. We're here about the charges against your wife, Samantha Jacobs, her attorney, Allison Cartwright, and her colleague, Alan Williams, Johnson said. I figured that, I said half-jokingly. What do you want to know? We understand that Mrs. Jacobs has filed a petition for divorce against you. Claims adultery. She insists this is all a big misunderstanding. Says you called in the report out of revenge, Carraway stated, looking at his notebook. I take it you haven't seen the video, I responded. Both of them looked at me, surprised. Apparently, they hadn't seen the video. I take it that's a no. Am I right? We're not aware of any video, Johnson said. Well, take a look at this, gentlemen. I'd offer you some popcorn, but I'm fresh out at the moment, I joked. I pulled up the video on my laptop and showed it to the detectives. They watched, stunned, as the three conspirators so glibly discussed murdering me if I didn't go along with their plot. They also took note of Alan's desire to load up my computer with something. Any idea what's on that little thumb drive Williams has? Johnson asked. Probably illegal spicy videos, I told him. Since Williams had it on him when he was arrested, you can probably find it at the county jail with the rest of his things. We'll need to go check it out, Carraway told Johnson, who instantly agreed. Can you get us a copy of all the videos you have of them? Johnson asked me. Sure, I replied. I'll give you a copy of everything I have, including the video of the conversation I had with Cartwright at Luigi's. Thanks. That would be a big help, Johnson said, handing me a thumb drive. I copied everything over and handed the drive back. When is the arraignment? I asked. Tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., Johnson said. In fact, the DA asked us to extend an invitation to you, since he might have to ask you a couple questions. I'll be there, I told him. Just one suggestion. You might want to look deeper into Cartwright. I suspect this isn't the first time she's tried something like this. What makes you say that? Carraway asked. I spoke with Alvin Morrison, Samantha's first husband. Cartwright pulled the same trick with him. If you like, I'll give you Morrison's contact information. Please do, Johnson said. The two detectives looked at each other as I wrote out Alvin's information. I also showed them the photos Allison used in both divorce cases. Interesting, Carraway said. Indeed, Johnson acknowledged. All right, Mr. Jacobs, we'll talk to this Morrison character, see what he says. Thank you for your cooperation. My pleasure, I told him. Just one last thing, Mr. Jacobs. Consider it a word to the wise. I know of your reputation. You're not a federal agent anymore. Pulling a weapon on an officer of the court isn't exactly the smartest move to make, no matter how justified you felt. Leave this to us. We'll take care of things from here. Got it? I got it, Detective Johnson, I said with a smile. We all shook hands and I walked them to the door. Seeing that it was time for lunch, I ordered a sandwich from room service and watched some television as I ate. Alice called me later that afternoon to let me know that Judge Banks not only rescinded the restraining order, he also released the freeze on my accounts and ordered Samantha to return 30% of all the money she had taken. He's also referring Cartwright to the bar and the state attorney's office for her unethical actions, Alice said. You have been busy, I told her. I'm just getting warmed up, cowboy, Alice responded with a slight chuckle. I plan to file your response and divorce papers tomorrow. 
The shit is about to hit the fan. So what now? I asked. I'll take care of getting the funds from Samantha. You work on that checklist I gave you, Alice said. That should take you the rest of the afternoon. Plan on moving back into your house tomorrow morning. Actually, I'd like to move back in today, I said. I need to change the locks and exorcise Samantha from my house. I've been invited by the DA to Samantha's arraignment tomorrow morning. Are you going to be there? Not unless you need me there, Alice replied. If they release any of them on bail, I'll need a restraining order, I told her. From what I've heard, the DA is going to recommend they be held until their trial, Alice said. But there's no telling what the judge will do. All right, I'll be there, just in case. Thanks, I said. After ending the call to Alice, I called Pop. Hey boy, how are things in your world? The older man asked in his usual salty manner. Doing better, Pop. Thanks for asking. Listen, the restraining order has been lifted, and I intend to be back at the house tonight. You think you can get some of your people over there to get Samantha's stuff out? Yeah, I can do that, son, he said. You think she's gonna be out on bail soon? Not from what I've heard, Pop, but you never know with some of these judges. Ain't that a fact? Pop hissed. What time you want the truck there? I'd say about 4.30. Shouldn't take too long to toss her crap into some garbage bags. Pop chuckled at that. You're a real class act, you know that, Mike? He jokingly asked. I learned from the best, Pop. I joked back. Yeah, you did. And don't forget that. We both laughed at that. All right, I'll have some people over about 4 o'clock. Let me know how the arraignment goes. I will, I promised. We ended the call and I headed to the bank to make the necessary changes to my accounts there. Then I went to the office and took care of things with HR. While there, I checked in with my boss, Jack Iverson. How are things going? He asked. Progressing, I said. Got the restraining order lifted and the bank account unfrozen. Samantha and her conspirators were arrested last night. Arrested? Jack asked, shocked. Yeah, conspiracy to commit murder, extortion. I hear there may be other charges pending. The arraignment is tomorrow morning. And the DA wants you there? Yes. He may call on me. I don't know yet. I hope it works out, Jack said. You moving back home today? That's my plan. Let me know how everything goes, Jack said. I will, I told him before taking my leave. I went back to the hotel and checked out, then drove home. Home. My castle. My refuge from the shit show known as life. I pulled into the garage closed the garage door and headed for the door that led to my kitchen. Before going inside, though, I drew my pistol. I didn't think there would be any nasty surprises waiting for me, but I wasn't about to take any chances. I carefully went inside and turned off the security alarm. The place seemed dark and quiet. Too dark and a bit too quiet, to be honest. The only sounds in the place came from the tall antique grandfather clock in the living room. I carefully examined the place to make sure no one was waiting for me finally convinced the place was secure. I holstered my weapon and carefully took my things upstairs and put them away before taking a shower and changing into something a bit more casual. Right at 4 p.m., I heard a large truck pull into my driveway. Looking out the window, I saw three men climb out and come to the door. I let them inside and handed them a box of large 30-gallon plastic trash bags and showed them the way to Samantha's closet. One of the men began put her clothes into bags, while another emptied her drawers and her toiletries in another. I showed the third man around the place and pointed out the sticks of furniture, pots, pans, dishes, CDs, and various trinkets Samantha brought from her condo. Once they were busy exorcising Samantha's crap from the place, I unlocked my office door and inspected everything inside. All looked to be in good order, so I fired up my whole house stereo. Soon, the unique sounds of classic toll filled the house. Yeah, I was home. Deal with it, pigs, I thought. I pulled out my phone and called a locksmith ISS recommended. I realized the late hour and offered to pay extra for the man's services. He reluctantly agreed and said he would be right over. The last thing I wanted, or needed, was Samantha or her conspirators having access to my house in the event they were released on bail. The locksmith arrived a half hour later and went to work. A couple hours later, the three men reported that they were finished. By then, the locksmith had changed all the locks on the doors and was happily on his merry way with a small wad of cash. I went through the place with the three men pop sent over to make sure they got everything. What about the pictures on the wall? The man I presumed was the lead, asked, pointing at the various photos of Samantha and I that dotted the place. Nah, I told him. I need kindling to start my fireplace tonight. They all laughed at that. By the way, could you do me a favor, please? What's that, Mr. Jacobs? 
First off, call me Mike. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind taking the mattress off the bed in the master bedroom. What do you want us to do with it? The lead asked. Maybe toss it in the dump, burn it, whatever. I don't care. I don't want it. I figured I would sleep in the guest bedroom and order a new mattress tomorrow. There was no way I was going to sleep on the mattress Samantha soiled with her infidelity. Sure. I understand, Mike, the lead said. Come on, give me a hand, he said to the other two men. Thanks, I appreciate it, I told him. They maneuvered the old mattress down the staircase and tossed it unceremoniously in the back of the truck. I thanked them for their work and gave them each a $100 bill. What the hell, I thought. They worked hard and deserved a little extra. We said our goodbyes, and I watched as they left with Samantha's crap. Turning back to the interior of the house, I took in the empty spots that had once been occupied by Samantha's things. Oh well, I thought. This too, shall pass. Tired and a bit hungry, I ordered some lasagna from Luigi's. The lady who took my order said it would take about an hour for delivery. That was fine with me, as I could use the time to decompress. Armed with a cup of steaming coffee fresh from my Keurig, I sat in my recliner and turned on the television to catch up on the news. A few minutes later, my phone buzzed, and I saw it was a call from Ron Wiseman. Curious, I took the call. Mike Jacobs, you old dog. How's it hanging? He asked. I just got back into the house. Exorcised the witch from it, and just kicking back. What do you have for me? Well, you'll be happy to hear I found no links between your wife and the old MMAS, despite her being Pat Witherspoon's daughter. I did, however. Find links between the old organization and the lawyer, Allison Cartwright. Oh. I asked. My interest peaked. Yes. It was about eight or nine years ago. She went by a different name at the time. Ellen Griswold. Worked in upstate New York. According to Witherspoon's notes, she had an issue with some of the more extreme measures the group took against cheaters. She had no problem with punishing the men they targeted, but she apparently felt some of the other actions were too extreme. When the group started going political, she decided to leave. Mona Larson let her go, strangely enough. She left New York, changed her name, and had some cosmetic surgery done. But there's more. I found a memo by Larson in which she considered a hit on Griswold. It never got carried out, since the memo was written just a few days before Larson was taken out, and the contract was never finalized. Very interesting, I said. I thought so as well, Ron said. She may have quit the organization, but she never gave up on the idea of punishing cheating husbands, though. For the last eight years, she's been with Hempstead, handling divorce cases. So far, she's only represented women. I'm doing a deep dive into those cases, but it seems that nearly 90% of them involve infidelity. How many cases has she handled so far? I asked. On average, she's taken on about 80 cases a year. Do the math. 80 cases a year for eight years, that's 640 cases, Ron said. Give or take. There's more. I found her name connected to about 500 bank accounts across the country. I'm still looking into all those, but it seems she can lay her hands on about $25 million total. Damn, I said. Yeah, and guess what? Those accounts happen to have been set up by her for the women she's represented. Samantha has such an account, set up when she divorced her first husband. Have you given this information to the district attorney? I asked. Yes, I just got off the phone with him. Our own DIU will be looking into it as well. What is that? Oh, that's right. That was set up after you left. Divorce Investigation Unit. Your old buddy, Ray Ochoa, runs it. I expect you might be getting a visit from one of his people in a day or two. Thanks for the heads up, I said. This actually explained quite a bit. I couldn't help but wonder what the DA would do with this information. Is there anything else? Not at this time, Ron replied. I'm still gathering and collating data. It could take a while for all of this to get pieced together. She's had eight years to set this up. There's something I don't understand, though, I told Ron. Why didn't Larson use the old poison capsule on her? Isn't that how she always handled loose ends? Yes, it was, at least toward the end. However, Griswold left the organization before Larson began implementing that on a wide scale. So she never got implanted. Or at least, that's what I gathered from Witherspoon's notes. Do you think Samantha knew about Cartwright's history? I asked. I doubt it, Mike but I'm pretty certain she knew what Cartwright is currently doing. She had to. You're probably right. Anything else? I have a feeling I'm just scraping the tip of the Cartwright iceberg here, Mike. I'll know a lot more over the next 24 to 48 hours. Okay. Well, thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. How's everything with you and Amy, by the way? I asked. We're doing great. Thanks for asking. 
Her knife-throwing skills are improving with every executive her company hires in, Ron joked. I laughed at that. I'll bet they are, I quipped. But on the upside, the number of sexual harassment complaints have tapered off to nearly nothing, Ron said, half-joking. We ended the call, and I turned back to the television. Before long, my dinner arrived, and I enjoyed my lasagna as I watched an old John Wayne movie. I followed that up with a drink and a cigar. I suppose this is where guys in my situation wax philosophic about life, love, and the meaning of the universe, which, as I recall from the old movie, is 42. Or something like that. Yes, I'm sad and deeply hurt, but I'm not made like that. I'm pretty much a just-the-facts, ma'am kind of person. So here are the facts. The bottom line is that Samantha cheated on me, then tried to set me up as the bad guy, going so far as to hook up with a lawyer with no ethics. Then she tried to steal my house and most of my assets on the basis of fabricated evidence. And to make matters worse, she went along with Allison's idea of having me killed if I didn't go along with their plot. On top of that, I learned that she had done this to another man. She was successful in that case, and I suppose she thought she would succeed with me. But she screwed up big time. You see, I don't like to lose an argument. I suppose I could have done a background check before we got married. But when you're in love with a woman, you don't think of such things. And yes, I was in love with Samantha at one time. I trusted her, perhaps too much. But that's neither here nor there anymore. Samantha screwed up, big time. And now, she needs to pay the piper. Perhaps, I thought, there really was something of her birth mother in her after all. I remember telling Allison they had declared war. The first part of my counteroffensive was complete. The restraining order has been lifted. The freeze on my accounts have been released. And I'm back where I belong, in my own home. Samantha has been exorcised from my personal kingdom and now sits in jail. I intended to do whatever I could to keep her there as long as humanly possible, along with her two co-conspirators. Tomorrow morning, I thought, was phase two of the counteroffensive. I would be at her arraignment. And if the district attorney calls on me to answer questions, I'll be more than happy to tell the court what I knew. Having finished my cigar, I headed upstairs, undressed and crawled under the covers of the bed in my guest room. It felt good to be home again and in my own bed, even if it is in the guest bedroom. But the place sure seemed empty without Samantha. I put that thought aside and decided to approach this like I would an intervention, which meant setting aside my emotions. Tomorrow is another day, but from this point on, I would be in control. And I don't like to lose an argument. The following morning, I got up, did my business, dressed, and grabbed a cup of coffee before heading to the courthouse. I wanted to see the three conspirators as they were brought into the courtroom. I was surprised to see Alice, my lawyer, show up in the courtroom. How are you holding up, Mike? She asked. Better, now that I'm back in my own house. That's good to hear. I wanted to be here to support you, just in case, Alice told me. I appreciate that, I responded with a smile. The double doors opened, and a line of orange-clad detainees was marched into the room. Allison, Samantha, and Alan were among them, and they didn't look too happy. Tough shit, I thought. Samantha's hair was a wreck and she had bags under her eyes. Allison didn't look much better. All rise, the large uniformed bailiff commanded. We stood up as the Honorable Wilfred T. Stone entered the courtroom in his long black robe, files under his arms. The judge nodded as he sat down, giving the bailiff his cue. Be seated, he ordered. Judge Stone began at one end of the line, and I couldn't help but notice that he was pretty harsh with the orange-clad people in front of him. It seems the word bail was foreign to him. Before he got to Samantha and her three cronies, however, a sharply dressed man and a woman I hadn't seen in ten years entered the courtroom and approached the district attorney. I recognized the man, U.S. Attorney Ronald Sharp. I had dealt with him before when I was in the service. The woman was Julie Bascom, who was stationed at the task force's Denver office when I was on active duty. I had worked with her a few times and was quite impressed. On top of that, she was a lovely brunette, and I was impressed with how she maintained herself over the years. While Ronald spoke with the district attorney, Julie made her way to me, and I couldn't help but smile when she got to us and extended her hand. Mike, it's good to see you again, Julie said with a smile. I'm sorry, Special Agent Julie Bascom, HFSDF, Julie told Alice while holding her credentials. I'm with the DIU, the Divorce Investigation Unit. Can we step out for a second? Uh, sure, Alice said. We stood and left the courtroom before Judge Stone could order us out. Ron was still talking with the DA and I could tell the DA wasn't happy. What's going on? I asked Julie. There's been some developments, Julie said. As of now, the feds are taking over the case against Allison Cartwright, Alan Williams, and your wife. So this is a task force issue then? 
I asked. Not entirely, Julie said. The FBI and a few other agencies are working this case, but we do have a dog in this hunt. I spoke to Ron Wiseman earlier, and he indicated there wasn't anything for the task force. What happened? I asked, confused. He found some disturbing things after the two of you spoke, handed them off to us, and we took it from there. You can probably figure out what happened after that. Anyway, it turns out that Allison was running her own little version of the old MMAS, and Samantha was helping her. Damn, what's William's role in all this? I asked. He was along for the ride, mostly. Arranged for the muscle to do the dirty work, if you will, Julie said. So what happens now? Alice asked. Federal marshals are prepared to take all three of them into custody. They'll be transported to D.C. while the federal grand jury examines the cases against them, Julie said. What are they being charged with? I asked. A whole slew of charges. Racketeering, extortion, money laundering, several conspiracy charges, including conspiracy to murder you, for starters. But the biggest charge is murder. It seems Allison had some of her uncooperative marks taken out. And from what we can tell, Samantha knew all about it. All in all, it's a pretty convoluted case. What about Williams? I asked. Evidence we gathered indicates he arranged for the accidents that left two men dead, Julie stated. And it appears there may be a third man dead, thanks to Williams. The U.S. attorney wants the death penalty for all three of them. Do you think it might be possible to see Mrs. Jacobs before they're taken away? Alice asked. I have a set of divorce papers to give her. I'll see what I can do, Julie told her before looking at me. I. Uh, don't have to report back to Fort Apache for a couple of days, Mike. Do you think we could maybe get together sometime? I got her hint. We had connected the few times we had been together before and shared a mutual attraction. Still, the task force had strict rules against field agents dating. As a matter of fact, I believe I owe you a dinner, I said. That's right, you do, Julie said with a slight smile. How about tonight then? Luigi's? They make a killer lasagna, I hinted. And after all these years, you still remember how much I love lasagna, she asked. Of course, I told her. Julie smiled as she wrote something on the back of a business card she handed me. Here's my personal cell and my current location. How does 6.30 p.m. sound? I'll be there, I told her, pocketing the card. Well, I guess we'd better get back inside, Alice said. We went back into the courtroom and saw Ron, the district attorney, and the lawyer for the three conspirators in discussion with the judge. We took our old seats and Julie walked to the two large federal marshals and engaged them in quiet conversation. I saw them look at each other, shrug their shoulders and nod their heads. I just spoke to the marshals. They said you can meet with Julie for a few minutes before they take them away, Julie whispered when she returned to us. I thanked her just as the confab at the judge's bench broke up, and Judge Stone pounded his gavel before speaking. Detainees Jacobs, Cartwright, and Williams. You are hereby ordered to surrender to federal marshals, who will transport you to Washington, D.C., where you will be detained until a federal grand jury completes its investigation, he said. He nodded at the bailiff, who unshackled the three conspirators from the rest. The two marshals immediately cuffed them and led them away, nodding at Julie. Come on, Julie said, standing up. Alice and I followed and met the marshals outside a small room behind the courtroom. Five minutes, one of the marshals said. Allison and Alan looked down at the floor, cuffed hands behind their backs. That's all we need, Alice said. Thank you. We went inside the room and found Samantha sitting at a table, her hands cuffed to a metal bar on the table. One of her colleagues from Hempstead sat next to her. Samantha looked up as we walked inside. Hello, Samantha, I said. I hope you're enjoying your little adventure. Screw you, Samantha said quietly. I chuckled in response. Not today, Samantha. Never again, in fact, I said. What do you want? The man next to her asked. You must be her attorney. Alice said. Yes. John Ashcroft, Hempstead Law Group. Well, Mr. Ashcroft, I'm Alice Hawkins, Mr. Jacob's attorney, and I'm here to serve divorce papers on your client. Do what you came to do, John said. Alice turned to Samantha and dropped the papers on the table. Samantha Jacobs, you have been served, Alice said. Yeah, whatever, Samantha said. John picked up the papers and looked through them. This is my client's response to the outrageous and illegal petition your client had served on him based on totally fabricated evidence put forward by an unethical attorney who is now facing multiple felony charges, including extortion and conspiracy to commit murder. I have requested the court reject her petition. You should advise your client to sign the papers now. Everything is in accordance with the prenuptial agreement your client signed before her marriage. 
There is also the matter of funds your client stole from the joint account. Those funds need to be returned immediately, otherwise I'll be forced to charge your client with theft. Here is a copy of the order demanding the return of those funds, if you haven't seen it already. With that, she dropped another paper on the table, which John picked up and read. Mrs. Jacobs has given me power of attorney over her affairs, so I will take care of this as soon as possible, Miss Hawkins. Is there anything else? Yes, I interjected, looking at Samantha. Why, Sam? What the hell happened? Samantha looked up at me, and I swear she looked like a totally different person from the woman I married. She shrugged her shoulders. Because. I could, she said. So what? So what? Is that all you have to say after all the years we had together? Yeah, Samantha deadpanned. I guess so. I nodded my head as her words sunk in. Then I realized that whatever love I may have had for her at one time was now completely gone. Her lawyer spoke up. I think our business here is concluded, Mr. Jacobs. My client has no desire to say any more, he said. You realize she's facing a potential death penalty? I asked him. Yes, I'm aware of that fact, Mr. Jacobs, John said. I looked at Samantha and saw a smirk as if she didn't care. Fine, I thought. Neither do I. Good luck, I said, motioning for Alice to leave. We went back into the hallway, and I came face to face with Allison, who also had a smirk. What's so funny? I asked her. She snorted before speaking. You just wait, Mike Jacobs. There's a whole new way coming. And when the sisterhood takes power, there'll be no room for dinosaurs like you, she sneered. I looked at Julie, who also picked up on Allison's statement. Well, from where I stand, it looks like there'll be no room for you either. Like I told you before, I don't like to lose an argument. I shot back. The door to the room opened, and Samantha returned with her attorney and the other marshal. John handed the divorce papers to Alice. They're signed, he said quietly. The marshal witnessed her signature, and I've notarized the papers. File them and get me a copy, if you would please. Consider it done, Alice said as she looked the paperwork over. Thank you. She put the package in her case, and we went our separate ways. Alice filed the paperwork, and Julie returned to the courtroom to meet with Ron, but not before reminding me of our dinner date. I left the courthouse and headed out, stopping to grab a burger. After my meal, I stopped at a mattress store and ordered a new mattress, one that could be adjusted. After I got home, I called Pop to let him know what had happened. What's going to happen to her? My father-in-law asked. I could hear the sadness and disappointment in his voice. No matter what Samantha had done, I liked and respected the old guy. He deserved to know the whole truth, but I was concerned it might be too much for him to take. It's all right. I can handle it, whatever it is. The U.S. attorney wants the death penalty, I said. I heard Pop sniffle as he fought to gain control of his emotions. Do you think they'll get it? Pop asked, his voice shaking. I don't know. I haven't seen the evidence, but from what I've been told, it doesn't look good for any of them. She's my only child, you know, Pop said quietly. I know. Does she have a good attorney? Those feds can really tear someone apart. I think her firm has that covered, I told him. Tell me something, honestly. Is this what you want for her? Pop asked. Honestly, I just want her out of my life, and I want her to pay for whatever crimes she committed but I don't want her dead. Thank you for that, son, Pop said. What are you going to do? I plan to move on, Pop. I'll probably get called to testify. Of course, I'll tell the truth. Let the chips fall where they may. From what I've seen, Samantha has a lot to answer for. That will be up to the jury. I understand, Pop said. We talked for a while, ending the call somewhat happier note. To be honest, I want my ex-wife to live as I have plans for her. Death would be an escape. After that, I called Luigi's and reserved a table for two for that night. I wasn't sure what to expect from my date with Julie. We had connected years ago when I was a federal agent. Still, nothing physical came from it as we were bound by task force regulations. I had wondered what she would be like in bed more than once. I got to Julie's hotel and called to let her know I had arrived and was on my way to her room. I was flabbergasted when she opened the door. Julie's long wavy hair cascaded over her bare shoulders. She wore a short black dress that accentuated her curves quite nicely. This was the first time I had seen her in something besides a dark pantsuit, and I was stunned at her beauty. Cat got your tongue, Mike? Julie asked with a mischievous smile. You're absolutely gorgeous, I stammered, feeling like a giddy teenage boy on a first date. Thank you, Julie replied. And I must say that you clean up rather nicely yourself. I offered her my right arm as I needed the left for my cane. She accepted, and we walked to my car. Being the gentleman I am, 
I even held the car door open for her. This is a very nice car, Mike, Julie said when I got in. Thank you. The benefits of being an executive. Wait until you hear the sound system. You still like Jethro Tull? Julie asked. You even have to ask such a silly question? I responded. Listen to this. I fired up the system and heard the sounds of thick as a brick. Yeah, it's one of my all-time favorites. The thing is, I knew Julie also liked Tull. Or at least she did the last time I saw her. So where the hell was Biggles? When you needed him last Saturday? And where were all the sportsmen? Who always pulled you through? They're all resting down in Cornwall. Writing up their memoirs. For a paperback edition. Of the Boy Scout manual. Oh, you certainly know the way to my heart. Mike, Julie exclaimed. That's one of my favorites. There's much more where that comes from. I told her as I drove out of the parking lot. We got to Luigi's and I happily escorted Julie through the door. Table for two, Jacobs, I told the girl at the front desk. Right this way, please, she said with a smile after confirming my reservation. We followed the girl to our table, and I was pleased to observe that it wasn't the same table where I had been recently ambushed by Samantha's lawyer. I could also see the jealous stares of the men in the restaurant as Julie accompanied me, our arms locked together. I thought Julie was the prettiest girl in the place. Tonight, she's with me. I held the chair for Julie then took my seat, leaning my cane against the wall directly beside me. A waitress came by with two glasses of water and took our orders. You seem to get around pretty good, even with that cane, Julie said after the waitress left. Thank you. I've had lots of practice over the years, I told her. Does it still bother you? I know they did a lot of work on that leg. Sometimes, if it gets really cold outside, or if it starts raining, I still can't put all my weight on that knee. I appreciated Julie's concern but I wanted to change the subject. How have you been? You were in Denver the last time I saw you. Yes, I was. I got transferred to the Seattle office. Stayed there about three years, then got moved to Miami. That was a wild assignment. Then I got picked for the DIU. And that's where I've been ever since, Julie said. How do you like working for Ray? I had known Ray Ochoa for a long time and always thought well of the man. I love working with Ray, Julie exclaimed. I especially like that he's not a micromanager. I worked with someone like that once, and it really pissed me off. I chuckled at that. I know what you mean. So, what's the deal with this DIU? I don't recall anything like that when I was in the service. Divorce Investigation Unit, Julie explained. It's fairly new, set up after the incident with President Pierce. Basically, we investigate the more extreme claims of spousal abuse and infidelity to see if there's any evidence to indicate involvement of MMAS holdovers or copycats. Must keep you pretty busy, I observed. Unfortunately, it does. A lot busier than I would like, Julie said sadly. Just curious, how many of your cases return positive results? Julie asked, finishing my thought. Not many. On average, about 2%. That's still a lot more than we'd like to see. I must say your case was quite interesting. Oh, how? None of the usual markers were there. But the fact that your soon-to-be ex-wife is the offspring of perhaps the most notorious field operative who ever worked for MMAS and that your wife's attorney was a former member of the group caught our attention quickly. Of course, I can't tell you much more than that because it's been turned over to the federal grand jury, but I can tell you that Wiseman and his research team uncovered quite a bit. And it looks pretty bad for all three of them. Your man, Torres, also uncovered a few things that really helped out as well. I'm glad he could help. I take it his findings have already been handed over to the appropriate authorities. Yes, they have. And he's been advised not to reveal everything he's learned national security, and all that. So please, don't be too hard on him. I won't. Terry is a good man. I trust him. But thanks for letting me know. You're welcome, Julie said. So, what's this talk about a new way and a sisterhood? I asked, recalling the conversation with Allison and Samantha earlier. You caught that, Julie responded. Well, after the old MMAS corporate structure was brought down, the organization morphed, went global became even more radical and less inhibited about things like murder. There was a county commissioner in Texas who was murdered not too long ago. As part of an experiment, damn, I shuddered. We still don't know if those terms are the group's new names, or just generic terms they use. Could be both for all we know. The bottom line is they're a lot more dangerous now than they were when you were in the service. You need to be very careful. Careful is my middle name. I quipped, causing her to chuckle. Just then, our orders had arrived. We both opted for Luigi's special lasagna, one of my favorites, dripping with three different kinds of cheese and loaded to the gills with meat and mushrooms. 
We both dug in, using our breadsticks to soak up the leftover sauce. This is absolutely delicious, Julie exclaimed. It's one of my favorites. I can make myself sick on this stuff. I can see why, Julie stated. By the way, there's a nice little dance club next door. When we're done here, would you like to go have something to drink and maybe dance off a couple of calories? I asked. Why, Mike Jacobs, if I didn't know any better, I'd think you're trying to seduce me, Julie said with a laugh. What me? I responded, feigning indignance. Yes, you. But for the record, I'd love to have a drink and a dance or two with you. That is, if you can keep up with me. Well, I admit, I'm restricted to slow dances these days, I teased. Julie's smile widened, and I took in her dimples. God, I could get lost in those dimples. How do you manage, with? I learned a long time ago to improvise, adapt, overcome, I told her. In that case, I'd definitely love a couple of nice slow dances with you. Mike, Julie said in a sultry tone that held a lot of promise. Our waitress came with the check, so I handed her my credit card, and she returned a few minutes later to wrap things up. After I finished with the bill, we headed out and walked to the dance club, which wasn't too busy, fortunately. Julie turned heads when she walked in, and I could almost hear the murmurs of the men in the place as they sized up my date. Naturally, none even suspected what Julie could do to them should they get out of line. We took a table and ordered our drinks. When the band started playing a slow dance song, I asked Julie for a dance, which she readily accepted. We made our way to the dance floor, and I wrapped my right arm around her while holding my cane in my left hand. Julie melded her body into mine as we worked our way around the dance floor. Slow and steady was the trick. You are amazingly light on your feet, Mike, Julie whispered as I held her close. I took in the scent of her hair as she placed her head on my shoulder. Where there's a will, there's a way, I whispered back. We danced through two slow songs and then returned to our table. That was nice, Julie said quietly when I sat down. I never thought of you as a dancer before. Well, things have changed a bit over the years. I've personally found it helped me considerably during my therapy. Did you and Samantha come here often? I try to make it a weekly thing at least, but to be honest, the last few months were pretty rough. She had been rather cold and standoffish for quite a while. At the time, I thought it was just stress from work. Now I know better, I said. Enough of my troubles. How have you been? Met Mr. Wright yet? Not hardly, Julie said with a chuckle. I don't know. Maybe it's the job that does it to people like us. We see so much hurt and pain. Not exactly the best environment for a relationship. I know what you mean, I acknowledged. I did meet someone once, Julie said wistfully, but he turned out to be a jackass. A player. I dropped him and never looked back. I'm sorry to hear that, I told her. Don't be, Julie scoffed. I'm just glad I found out before it was too late. Yeah. So what are your plans now? I intend to stay with the task force. I'll be looking to retire in a couple of years or so. Thought I'd maybe get a condo on the beach somewhere and share it with a cat or something. That's a hell of a commentary, isn't it? I suppose so, Julie said. I could see the sadness on her face and I changed the subject, hoping to lift her spirits a bit. What do you say we blow this joint? Maybe take in some music or something? You still have that collection of toll? Julie asked. As a matter of fact, I do, I told her. I've even added to it since the last time we saw each other. Well, what are you waiting for? Please. Take me to your parlor, kind sir, Julie drawled as she draped her arms over my shoulders. Where did that come from? I asked, surprised. From a book I read online, Julie answered. Are we going, or what? Yes, ma'am, I said, grabbing my cane. After paying our tab, we left the club and headed to my place. When we got there, I gave Julie the nickel tour of the place, which ended in my office where I kept my stash of toll vinyl. I don't care what anyone says. Nothing compares to the music on those old records. I let Julie pick which album she wanted to hear and was a bit surprised when she selected a passion play. I fired up my stereo and placed the album on the turntable. We headed to the front room as the music filled the house. After pouring a couple of glasses of wine, we sat on the couch and listened to the music. I turned the album over to play side two when the first side finished. Julie got a kick out of the story of the hare who lost his spectacles and giggled uncontrollably when I returned to the front room. Julie was still giggling as the story concluded. And after all, Hare did have a spare a pair. A pair. What's so funny? I asked as the music continued. I don't know why, but that story cracks me up every time I hear it, Julie said. She set her wine glass down and turned to me. Unbuttoning my shirt, she ran her hand over my chest while staring intently into my eyes. Mike, did you ever wonder? 
She never finished her sentence. That's because our lips had come together in the hottest kiss I had ever experienced, even with Samantha. Our tongues wrestled for what seemed like forever. She broke the kiss and looked at me. Yes, many times, I whispered. Julie climbed over me and straddled my legs, lifting her short dress up to her waist. She wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me again. She broke the kiss and whispered in my ear. Make love to me, Mike, she hissed. Please. She didn't need to coax me any further. The next thing I knew, clothes were flying off both of us, and it was wild. We lay there on the couch, drained, for just a few moments. We looked into each other's faces as the intensity of our coupling slowly faded. I think the song is about finished, Julie finally said. I listened and realized she was right. There was a rush along the Fulham Road into the Ever Passion play. I believe you're right, I said. I guess that makes this our song? Julie smiled back. Yes, our song, she said with a smile. Why don't you put on another album? Okay, I said as she kissed my face. She climbed off my lap, and I managed to stand with the help of my cane. I swapped a passion play with Live, bursting out, and went back into the front room, where I collapsed on the couch. Julie's eyes were drawn to the scar on my thigh. You okay? I asked. I'm more than okay, she said. It's just, I've never seen your scar before. That's worse than I thought. It's a lot better now, I said. If it bothers you, I can put my trousers back on. No, don't, Julie pleaded. It's part of you. I'm not bothered by it. I've got a few scars of my own, you know? To me, Julie looked perfect, but looking closer, I could see a few reddish lines on her torso. That happened in Seattle. A knife fight. You should see the other person. Does it bother you? Not at all, I told her. You're perfect, just as you are. I hesitated for just a second before asking my next question. Would you like to, uh, stay the night? Her smile lit up the room. I thought you'd never ask, Julie said as she wrapped her arms around me. We went upstairs, leaving our clothes in the front room. I hope you don't mind if we use the guest bedroom. I have a new mattress coming for the master bedroom. That explains the box springs, Julie said. I thought maybe you had some kind of weird fetish or something. We both laughed at that. We climbed into the guest bed and snuggled for a while. I really enjoyed our time together. You have no idea how long I've wanted to do that with you. Really? I'm glad you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it myself. To tell you the truth, I never wanted it to end. Julie smiled before kissing me. Then we fell asleep in each other's arms. I woke up the following day to the smell of bacon. After doing my business in the master bathroom, I threw on some casual clothes. I went downstairs to see Julie in the kitchen dressed only in one of my long sleeve shirts. Good morning, sleepyhead. She smiled as she handed me a cup of coffee. Breakfast is about finished. You're going to spoil me. You know that? I asked before giving her a kiss. Isn't that the idea? She responded. I smiled at that. She returned and brought two plates with eggs, bacon, and toast. She handed me one and set the other down in front of her. This is delicious, I said after taking a bite of the eggs. Thank you, Julie said. Kinda hard to screw up an egg, though. Maybe, I said. Or maybe it's the fact that you cooked it when you didn't have to. Thank you for last night, Julie said with a hint of sadness. I really needed that. I think we both did, I told her. That was the best night I've had in a very long time. I wished it would never end. But I know you've got a job to do. I understand. Yes, I do have work I need to finish. But Fort Apache isn't that far away. We always have weekends. Besides, I'll be retiring in a couple years. That'll give us some time to get to know each other a bit better. What do you think? I'd like that, I told her. I really felt a connection last night that I haven't felt with Samantha in a long time. And I want to make sure this wasn't just two ships passing in the night. I concur, Julie said. I want you to know that I don't make it a habit of spending the night, well, like we did last night. I've been attracted to you for a long time, and I've been attracted to you as well. Is there a, but, I'm hearing in your voice? I don't want to be a rebound relationship for you, Mike. You're just starting your divorce. You have a long road ahead of you. Trust me, I've seen what divorce does to people. It's not pretty, but I'll be here for you anytime you need me. Thank you for that, I told her, trying to keep a neutral tone. Why don't we take it slow and easy for a while? I'll come out and spend the weekends with you if you want. If you need to talk, call me anytime. There's no need to rush, and before you ask, no, I don't have a boyfriend anywhere else. I knew what Julie said made sense and mulled it over for a few moments before responding. All right, I said. You're welcome here anytime. And of course, I want to see you on the weekends. You realize I may have to work some weekends, right? 
Oh yes, I know that all too well. Been there, done that, remember? Julie chuckled at that. I'll never forget, she said, but I do have to get dressed. I have to meet the U.S. attorney this afternoon, and I don't think he'd appreciate me showing up like this, Julie added, holding open the shirt. I smiled at that. I don't know. I rather like seeing you dressed that way, especially at my table. I laughed, causing Julie to smile. You're so naughty, Julie chided. Yes, I am, I joked back. We kissed and hugged each other for a few moments before Julie stood, gathered her clothes from the living room, and headed upstairs. I watched her cute little bare hips sway under my shirt with a smile, then cleared the table and cleaned up the dishes. Julie came back downstairs a half hour later, dressed and ready to return to her hotel, so I grabbed my keys, and she followed me to the car. When we got to the hotel, she leaned over and gave me another scorching hot kiss full of promise. What do you want for dinner tonight? I asked. Surprise me, Julie said, smiling. I have to fly back to Fort Apache tomorrow morning. Think you can stand to have me around one more night? I think I can manage that. I'll just have to tell my other girlfriends I've got a date, though. I quipped. Yeah, right, she said, slapping my arm. I'll call when I'm done, all right? Sounds good. By the way, you might as well have this, I said, handing Julie a key to the house. I also pulled out a card with the security code to the alarm. This is the code for the security alarm. Once you open the door, you have just under a minute to enter the code. Thank you for that, Julie said, taking the card. She gave me one more kiss that held a lot of promise, then exited the car and closed the door. I waited until Julie was in the hotel, then left and drove to the office. What, are we working casual today, and no one told me? Jack asked when I walked into the executive office suite. I laughed as I walked into his office. You sure seem to be in a better mood today. I take it everything is going okay. Yes, it is, I replied. In more ways than one. By the way, have you seen Terry? I need to talk to him. I haven't seen him, but I'm sure he's around here somewhere, Jack said. I'll call him then. No big deal. How did the arraignment go? Better than I hoped. Samantha and her co-conspirators are now in federal custody and on their way to Washington. Seems they're being investigated by a federal grand jury. Interesting, Jack said. So, are you back for good now? I think I'll be good to go from here on. I do have a date tonight, though. A date? You sure do move fast, Mike. Who is she? Her name is Julie Bascom. We were in the service together. She's retiring in a couple of years or so. Well, you enjoy your date then. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Jack joked. I laughed at that. Yeah, right, I said before heading to my office. When I got there, I called Terry. Hey boss, I was just getting ready to come see you. Everything all right? I asked. Yeah, I just wanted to give you my final report. I look forward to that. I'll be there in about five minutes, Terry said before ending the call. True to his word, Terry came into my office four minutes later carrying a fairly thick folder, which he handed to me. Wow, you have been busy. I told him as I hefted the heavy folder. I take it you provided a copy of this to the feds and Ms. Hawkins? Yes, Terry said. That special agent Bascom seemed quite pleased to get it. You already know much of what's in that report. I got a full file on that Williams character and on Morrison's divorce from Samantha. It wasn't pretty. Did you forward a copy to Williams' wife in New York? I asked. Not yet, but I will if you want. Please do, I instructed. Consider it done, Terry said. Anything on the photos? Yeah, I spoke to my audio video guy. He agrees those appear to be printouts from digital images that have been photoshopped. Couldn't say much more than that without seeing the original digital files, though. That makes sense, I reasoned. Anyway, it's all there. Everything I could dig up in just a couple days. Hope it helps. Yes, Terry, it does, I said. Nice work. Thanks. I owe you big time. My pleasure, boss, Terry responded with a smile. Well, I have to get back to it. Let me know if there's anything else you need. We'll do, Terry, I told him. We shook hands, and I watched as he left the office. I spent the next couple of hours looking through the package Terry put together and wondered if I ever really knew Samantha. I finally closed the folder and tossed it on my desk. It was all academic now, I thought, as it was in the hands of the grand jury. I caught up with the rest of my work and realized it was lunchtime, so I headed out to grab a sandwich. While I was out, I planned the evening meal I would share with Julie, and I wanted to do something special for her. At first, I considered taking her out to that new steakhouse, but I had a change of heart and decided to grill a steak for her instead. After lunch, I returned to the office and checked in with Jack. If you don't mind, Jack, I'd like to head out a bit early. I need to stop at the store on my way home, I said. 
Yeah, sure, Mike, Jack said. We got everything under control here. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate that. With a wave, I left and stopped at the store, where I grabbed a couple of thick steaks, potatoes, and all the fixings. I also grabbed a bottle of wine, then headed home. My phone buzzed as I was preparing the meat, and I saw it was Julie, so I took the call. Hey, G-Man, she said when I answered. It had been a while since I heard that, and I couldn't help but smile. Hey yourself, I responded. How's your day so far? Interesting, Julie said. I called to see what you had in mind for dinner. I'm in the process of preparing a couple steaks. I thought I'd grill us some steaks and a couple baked potatoes with green beans. How does that sound? Meat. Yes, Julie exclaimed. I'd love a home-grilled steak. Your wish is my command, I jokingly said. So, any news? Yeah, I'll tell you when I see you tonight. I look forward to that. I just have to stop at the hotel to change, pack up and check out. That is, assuming you still want me to spend the night, Julie whispered. Of course, I said. All right then, I'll see you in a bit. We said our goodbyes and ended the call. I returned to my preparations, a smile on my face, as the words of a favorite tune played on the house stereo. Oh, the leaded window opened, but you moved the dancing candle flame, and the first moths of summer. Suicidal came, oh suicidal came. I had just finished all the preparations when the doorbell rang. Answering it, I saw Julie with a clothes bag and an overnight bag, so I invited her inside. You know, you don't need to ring the doorbell. I appreciate that, Mike, Julie said as she entered. Oh, I can smell that barbecue already. I haven't put the meat on yet. I wanted to wait till you got here. How do you like yours, by the way? Rare. I mean, so rare that it practically moves. A woman after my own heart, I quipped. Let me go put this stuff upstairs and I'll be right out, Julie said. Need any help with that? I got it, but thank you for offering anyway, Julie answered as she went up the stairs. I went out, put the food on the grill, and then opened the wine. Julie came back down, put an arm around my waist, and kissed me on the cheek. I felt more love in that small act than I had felt from Samantha in a long time. The food ready, I grabbed a couple of plates and loaded them with the steaks and potatoes. We went into the kitchen, spooned some green beans, and then loaded the potatoes with butter and sour cream. This smells so delicious, Mike, Julie said. I hope you like it, I told her. Been a while since I grilled anything. I'm sure I'll love it. Been a long time since I had a man cook a meal for me. Next time, I'll take kitchen duty, okay? You're on. I responded. I watched as she took her first bite of steak. She closed her eyes and moaned as she ate her food. This is divine, Mike. Perfect. Thank you for saying so. We ate our food, engaging in small talk. When we finished, Julie insisted on cleaning up the dishes, so I let her. Then we retired to the front room with a glass of wine. So, anything interesting happened today? I asked after we settled down on the couch. Yes, actually, we went over the evidence from Cartwright's house. She saw the look on my face. I figured they would execute a search warrant, but I wasn't aware that it had already been done. I probably should have told you. The FBI searched her place the day after the arrest. Found an awful lot. Oh. For starters, they found the digital files Cartwright used to make the photos. Believe it or not, she used the same base photos against hundreds of men over the years. Damn, I said. You can say that again. We also have information on all of the accounts Cartwright has access to. The funds in all of them have been frozen for the time being. We're talking millions more than we originally thought. So, she's been running this scam for years, I said. Yes, with Samantha's help, I might add. And as you thought, William's thumb drive was full of illegal spicy videos, which we also found on Cartwright's computer. It appears to us that she used that along with the faked photos as leverage against her targets. We also found evidence directly linking Cartwright and Williams to at least three murders. That, on top of their conspiracy against you. Sounds like they'll be going to prison for a very long time, I added. Well, if Ron has his way, all three of them will get the needle, Julie said. We just have to wait to see what the grand jury says. It could take months for the investigators to sort all of this out. Maybe a couple of years, based on what I saw. What about all the men Cartwright screwed over? I asked. That's a whole different can of worms, Julie said. I expect there'll be a judicial review of every divorce Cartwright worked on. And I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of lawsuits filed. Your attorney, Alice, is chomping at the bit over that. I chuckled at that. I'm sure she is. At any rate, it's going to be a bloodbath, legally speaking. I'd be very surprised if Hempstead survives the fallout, Julie said. So, you've got your work cut out for you the next couple years, 
then, I take it. Julie nodded her head. Yeah, Ray put me on point. So I'll either be here or at Fort Apache. I'll probably have to go to Washington now and then. At least you won't have to worry about a place to stay when you come here, I told her. Julie smiled and wrapped her arms around my neck. No, I don't. I just hope you don't get tired of having me in your bed. I could never get tired of that, I told her. We took another sip of wine and fell into each other's arms for our second night of lovemaking. My divorce went through without a hitch, as I knew it would. Alice filed a number of lawsuits, and by the time it was all over, more than 600 men, including Alvin, walked away with a nice size check. Alice cut her percentage by more than half. Even then, she walked away with enough money to retire. Hempstead nearly went under, what with the bad press and judicial reviews, but managed to survive. As Julie predicted, the federal investigation took 26 months to complete. At the end of the investigation, a federal grand jury handed down several indictments against Samantha, Allison, and Allen for various charges, including premeditated first-degree murder. Ron, the U.S. attorney in charge of the case, sought the death penalty for all three. Julie spent those 26 months commuting between Fort Apache, Washington, D.C., and my house. It was nice having her with me, and our love for each other grew to the point that I asked her to marry me a few days before Samantha's sentencing hearing. I thought you'd never ask, Julie said as I slipped the engagement ring on her finger. We celebrated with a night of unbridled passion. Pop was happy for us, and even happier when Julie asked him to walk her down the aisle. Samantha was given the opportunity to turn against her co-conspirators in exchange for a guilty plea and a life sentence. She wisely accepted, much to Pop's relief. After making the deal, she sang like a canary. As a result, Allison and Alan, who had been cleaned out by his wife in her divorce, were convicted of all charges and sentenced to death. I saw Samantha twice after she was taken to Washington. The first time was during the trial when I was asked to testify. She sat in her chair, her face downcast as I answered the questions put to me. The second time was at the sentencing hearing. Pop and Julie joined me for that trip. Samantha looked like hell the second time I saw her. Her hair, which used to be full and voluminous, was now ratty with streaks of gray. She looked as if she had aged 20 years, and wrinkles lined her face. She looked at me with hatred after her sentence was announced. Happy now, she spit. Actually, I've never been happier, I answered, glancing at Julie. I saw a tear form in Samantha's eye, then she looked down. I glanced at Allison, who looked as worn and tired as Samantha. I told you, I don't like to lose an argument. Allison dropped her head and studied the table in front of her. With a smile, I walked away and started a new chapter in my life. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.